Hello and welcome to the Clock and Talk, an Arsenal podcast, and we're covering, for fuck's sake. Good job, me and Schwinn are a lot more prepared than you, because if we came on and went, oh yeah, we didn't watch the game either, we was on the pit, it'd be a pretty shit podcast. Well, Mesut Ozil is the best number 10 in the Premier League. Yeah, that all looks good on paper, but there's never been a football match played on paper, so it's not really worth much. I'm going to make a bold prediction that Jack Wilshere will sign for West Ham United. It's time to start watching football with your eyes. I think people listen to what the commentator is saying and have that as their own opinion, but if you watch what's going on, you'll see things a lot clearer. Schwinn, who do you think is going to win the Golden Boot? I think Alexis Sanchez might do a number on that this year. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Tony talks about a clock being right twice a day. Tez is right every day. Try it from five, lads. Fucking beauty. Thank you for listening. Thank you for downloading with us here at the Clock and Talk. You can follow us on Twitter at Clock and underscore Talk. You can follow us on Facebook, and we are now on YouTube as well. Um, we are on every podcast app available to mankind, as far as I know. Uh, each and every week, we are jo- I am joined by uh, Tony and Schwinn. How are we, Tony? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. Um, not a good weekend for football in all. Obviously, our result and things off the pitch, which I'd probably say a bit more important. But me and myself, I'm good. I'm good. And Schwinn, how are you, buddy? Uh, doing well. Could be worse. But you know what? Let's just get into it and get this over with. Okay, before we actually get into it, Schwinn, I'd just like to, um, if you could take it away and just touch on the sad events that happened over the weekend, mate. Yeah, it's been it's been a dark day in in a sport that you know we we love and we cherish. I mean, uh, I think everyone knows I'm talking about what happened with the, the Leicester City owner uh, Vichai Superbrother, I think is his name. Uh, forgive me if I'm butchering it, but you know just just to go over it a bit because he has been an amazing personality and figure in football in England and and just in the sport in general. You know, Leicester City was a tiny football club. And when Vichai came in, he he did a lot around the around the club and the community. I mean, for for Leicester to come up through the divisions, win the championship, and then of course win the, the Premier League in an amazing fashion is is an amazing amazing feat. You know, they've they've bought the stadium back there. There's plans for expansion, I think, of the stadium. Uh, there's also a new state of the art uh, training facility that that seems to be in the works. A quarter final of the Champions League. You know, there's so much activity that's happened off the field. They've given away free season tickets. Uh, you know, periodically they'd give away free beers, free scarves, uh, donated millions into the community, uh, to hospitals, to to foundations. I mean, this really became a bond that that the, the owners uh, that that doesn't seem to be the case anymore. Created with with the local community. I mean, I dare say he was a model owner, you know, who, who went above and beyond his duties. Um, he endeared himself to the city of Leicester and achieved the absolute impossible. Uh, it's a loss that all football fans feel and mourn for. I mean, nothing we say will, will fill this void, but as a duty to the sport, you know, from all of us at the Clock and Talk, uh, we are with you, with, with the city of Leicester, with the, with the people of Leicester City Football Club and everyone affiliated uh, in these in these sad times, we mourn with you for the loss of these five love lives. Well said, Mike. Okay, let's get into it. Tony, straight away, I'm going to get you to do a 30-second recap of a midweek game that we had in the Europa League against Sporting Lisbon. 30 seconds, go. Uh, shit game, decent performance, controlled the game, 1-1-0. It will probably never be spoke of again. Danny Welbeck should be knighted. Let's move on. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, right. Let's get into this Crystal Palace game. Uh, line up, Tony. Thoughts on that one? Any shocks there? Um, yeah, there was a couple for me. Um, I was surprised Granite was kept at left back. I know Emery likes the balance of having a left footed out there, and we pretty much don't have anyone else. But I thought if that was to be the case, then he would protect him and as good as Aubameyang is going forward, he's, he's not going to protect um, protect any left-back all too well. So that was a bit of a surprise. Uh, he also done what I feared he would do and move Iwobi to the right. 
uh, just because he's been playing well on the left, it feels like they've kind of tried to shoehorn everyone in. Aubameyang's obviously come on and got two goals last week. Iwobi was excellent. So he's kind of wanted to give them both starts, but it doesn't really fit. And I think sometimes you need to be a bit more ruthless. And, and even if some people are playing well, they have to fit into your system. Um, so, I mean, it wasn't the worst lineup. It was probably close to what we expected. But I just saw a couple of things in there that I'm not particularly fond of. Mm, okay, and you, Schwinn? Um, Petr Cech was available, but obviously did not feature on the day. There was there was some question marks on you know whether Cech is going to get his spot back. We spoke about that, of course, last week, and I think there was the unanimous decision that you know, for us at least that Leno should retain his spot, and that was indeed the case. Socrates, uh, again, I was surprised not to see him included. I thought after Sporting, he was looking himself. Uh, you know, maybe he's not 100% fit, but he did look sharp on the day and I was hoping he'd be included I wonder whether that is a meritocratic decision or it's you know it's a more of a cautious decision in that regard but other than that you know of course Tony spoke about drawing that left back I'm sure we'd speak about that a bit more but other than that it seemed the team pretty much picked itself okay um now let's go through this game a little bit Tony and there's there's not a hell of a lot to fucking talk about in this first half um I got nothing, mate. Uh, first half, it was all Crystal Palace. Uh, pretty much. Uh, well, we, to me, I think we had three big chances, but because they weren't converted into even shots on target, they're not even remembered. I watched the highlights package last night, and they weren't even on there. Well, one was. Uh, so there's one where we nicked the ball in the edgy area. Lacazette, uh, on his left foot, from a, just on the edge of the area, puts it wide. Basically one-on-one. Has the whole goal to aim at. Again, you don't remember it because the keeper wasn't worked. Then we had another chance, which, again, I haven't seen back. But from the ground, I think Ozil cut it back from the right to Bellerin. And he took one touch too many and, and they got a block in. As I said, I've not seen it back. But at the ground, that looked like an unbelievable chance. And then there was another one on the counter attack where Aubameyang was on the shoulder of the last defender on, on about the halfway line. And Lacazette literally had most of the Palace half to get the ball into. And Aubameyang would have been in one-on-one and he managed to pick out the defender. And nothing came of it. And that attack broke down on the halfway line. But a better ball, when you'd say a Bamiyang one-on-one from 40 yards out, you'd, you'd, nine out of ten times you'd expect him to score. So I think there was three good, I'd say, opportunities that maybe didn't materialise into chances. Mm, the, the one that main one that really stood out for me, I suppose, was the Lacazette miss um, around the 20 It was the only one we got, got the shot away. As On my highlights package, that was the only one that was shown. Yeah. But again, it was the only one we actually had a shot. Mm. That was the that was the one you'd expect a, a, a striker to score though, isn't it? Like, yeah, I, I would. I would. Well, at least work the keeper. Mm. But yeah, I'd, I'd expect. Well, yeah, look, it went quite a bit wide as well. The couple of yards wide, I'd, I'd expect a hell of a lot better. Is the mm. is, is the main point of that? Um, Schwinn, there's a penalty, 40, 44th minute, forty fifth minute or something. Then Crystal Palace obviously get the one nil goal. Um, they go in the half time leading 1-0, mate. Um, penalty with Mustafi? Yeah, this was, I think, one of those cases where Mustafi did indeed have his brain fart. You know, we've been dreading it ever since the season has started. And to be fair to him, he's been pretty consistent and consistently good, I would say, up until this moment. And that is just a lack of awareness in the box. I mean, in, in the incident preceding to that, Rob Holding had a clear shout where he was obviously fouled. I mean, his shirt was torn. Um, he was making a case for himself to the linesman, to the referee, but the, Martin Atkinson was having none of it. And obviously in the build-up to the goal, you know, th- th- there's a lot of questions there. I think, in fact, an assistant, uh, one of Emery's assistant, actually got into a tussle with the referee at a half time and was eventually sent into the stands. Uh, I'm forgetting his name, but... It, it clearly shows that the bench wasn't having any of that. And, you know, it was we were hard done by in that incident. Mustavi should be doing better. He should be aware of who's around him. Even if Kuyate gets the ball there, you know, his back is towards goal. So, you know, it is giving up possession in a very dangerous area. But, you know, that's still better than lunging in, which we all know Mustafi loves doing. Uh, unfortunate to concede at that point, you know, so close to halftime. Your, your halftime team talk completely changes at that point. I'm, I'm sure Emery still had a lot to say because of how, uh, you know, the game eluded us throughout the first half. But that was, you know, one of the the worst things that could have happened at that point. 
just to to add to that, for me, it was a foul on holding. But I think it, where it was, it was on the inside, and and you know that nine times out of ten they're not going to be given because the IU's body was between the linesman and where he was fouling holding. And as I said, I think it was a foul, but holding's got to do a hell of a lot better. Pull it out for a throw. It was right in front of me. Like that's where the away fans were. Mm-hmm. Just knock it out for a throw. Like as I said, yeah, you're being fouled, but you've got to do better than that. Mm-hmm. I think I think that's what he tried to do, right? I think he just miscued his kick, maybe because he was being tugged at, and the ball went out for a corner. Or yeah, I mean, I'm I'm, 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 a, I'm sure I'm sure he tried to pull it out for a throw on, but you've got to do it. As I said, you've got to be strong enough to if you are getting a pull. And as I said, I do think it was a foul, but I would expect any centre back to be able to kick the ball out for a throw on there. I, he did try and do that, but it's the difference between he tried to do the right thing, the execution was poor. Right. Hmm. Okay, so half time, Tony, we go into the dressing room, down one nil again. Emery must get in that dressing room at half time and go, "What the fuck was that?" Like, it, it happens every week, just about. We always go into the dressing room, either one nil down, two nil down, and then we got to somehow come out second half. And and I, I and you boys may correct me if I'm wrong, but I've seen a stat we've scored twenty two goals in. Um, second halves or something. I seen a stat yesterday floating around. Um, I think, fucking hell. So when he gets into that dressing room, what's what's he saying, do you think, Tony? Fuck no. There's a clear change between our first half performances and our second half performances. It was like, yesterday, it was like we realised that we actually might be a good team for a bit and we just controlled the ball for between pretty much the the whistle going to start the second half and us going 2-0 up, we, we just dominated the ball. And the way it is at Palace, there's a pole uh, in the ground that kind of makes it difficult to see one end of the pitch from where the away fans are sat. And it was the way we were kicking in the first half. So it was a bit harder to see first half attacks. Uh, in the second half, it was like, oh, brilliant. The ball's never going to be down there because literally for 15, 20 minutes, everything was in that like our attacking half. And then... Obviously, things change, but I don't know what he, he says to make them realise that, oh, actually, we can control the ball and, and play a bit of football. Um, it's, it's just weird. No, it is, it is. Um, and then, obviously, we get a, we get a uh, what, free kick, and who fucking scores, boys? Oh, what a fucking goal! Granite Shaka, you legend. 51st minute. He uh, sets the equaliser up. 1-1. What do we think of that one, boys? Oh, he absolutely twatted that in. There's there's no saving those. And, I mean, the goal is, is absolutely beautiful. Um, and we've seen something like that before from him against Newcastle, of course. But what I loved about it was the celebration. To, to go and... You know, hug the manager. I think it shows a lot of solidarity on the day with the result. You know, it's something that that's going to be overlooked. But I think the players are forming a very special bond with the manager, which is, you know, not easy to do when when there has been someone in place for so long, and then you know, obviously he's gone now, and to come in within two months, two and a half months to form that sort of relationship is is, is special. And I think Ground and Celebration spoke highly of that. Mm-hmm. You, Tony. Enjoyed that? Yeah, again, it was right in front of me. Um, literally right in front of me. Uh, great hit. You could see it was in, basically, as soon as it left his boot. Um, for me, and maybe just because of what ended up going on, I wasn't a fan of the celebration. Because to me, I read it, and I could be completely wrong, I read it as, like, thanks for sharing faith with me and keeping me in the team or, or giving me confidence to play in this position. But I don't want him playing there. Not only do I not want him playing left-back, I think we massively miss him in the middle of the pitch. So, as I said, the way as I said, I could be reading it completely wrong, the way some people read Ramsey's celebration wrong a couple of weeks ago. But for me, thanking him for keeping him in the team, uh, he should be kept in the team as a centre midfielder where he plays. Because for me, and we said it, look, we all said it after the Leicester game, it is not a, a long-term solution. I could understand him playing there for the last 20 minutes of a game or last half hour of a game as he did against Leicester when you need to maybe get someone more attacking on in the middle and you're chasing a game. But to, for him to be playing now two games in a row to full 90 minutes there, for me, is 
is not a good solution. And and again, I'm not saying this in hindsight because we all said this last week. Mm. Uh, mate, no, I'm, I totally agree with you. And I said to you at the start of this podcast, look, I've got fucking a few things to say about this, Brennan, playing left back because I think it's absolutely fucking bullshit. I'm, I I think we miss him um, really big time playing centre midfield and people are going to sit there and say, oh, Tez, you off your fucking chops again, mate. But uh, let me tell you, when you've got Granite Chaka playing left uh, left back, we are missing, we're missing creativity in the centre. And and I'm not going to blame Emery for playing left back because, okay, Emery, who else has he got to choose from? And this is the problem that I worry about Arsenal is Emery's... Emery's got to play the cards he's been dealt. He's got to play the players he's got on hand. Now, he's looked at a he's looked at some players and he's gone, okay, I've got I've got um, Lick Steiner who didn't obviously work at left back, so I'll put in a left footer and I'll put in Granite Shaka. Yes, okay, it it probably may have filled a void in one position, but it's taken taken it away from another. So you type of Robin Peter to pay Paul. But the problem is, is I blame the the fucking powers in, in at the start of the transfer window. We've got Monreal, we've got Klozenac, and both of them are now injured. So now we've been left with no left back. People are going to sit here and say, "Oh, well, what's what's wrong with um, uh, Maitland Niles?" But but then, yeah, okay. He, he did a good job last year, but you've got two managers. Wenger put him in, but Emery obviously doesn't see him as a left back. Now, I, I don't know what why Emery doesn't see him as a left back. Wenger did. You tell just me. To, just, just to interrupt that, I think Emery probably would have done. He started there against City ahead of Lichsteiner on the first game of the season when both Monreal and Kolesnach are out. But obviously Ainsley's just come back off of being injured in that game and he played the under-23 games the day before. So okay, so that's why he was never going to play. He's, he's played. Yeah. I also I agree with most of what you're saying, but uh, I don't I don't particularly blame whoever it is that's signing people because you can't have three specialist left-backs. Um, Mate, I'd rather never... Billy, as, you, as what do you call him, Billy Big Balls. I'd rather him there who can play left-back because I also worry about it on the right. You've got Bellerin out injured now. So we're going to throw Licksteiner in. Now, touch fucking wood. What happens if Licksteiner gets injured? I think that's the way it is. I think you can only have, in, in places where you're only going to play one of them, so full, either fullback, I think you can only really have two specialists of each in a squad and then someone like Maitland-Niles, who's who are called a floater, that can do, can do either. It's not their job, but they're, they're adept at doing it if needed. I don't think you can have three specialist left-backs and three specialist right-backs. Because you're just going to end up with a massive squad, of, and these players, when they're not going to get games, we've seen Lichsteiner as it is, is only really getting games. He's played what probably 300 minutes of football since he's been yeah, here. So he's imagine you had much. someone behind him. Like when when does that guy play? Yeah. And then even when he does have to play, you bring him in, and everyone says, "Oh," and he, and if he has a bad game, "Oh, it's because he hasn't played." But you don't physically have time to play all these players. Um, for me, I I know it didn't work great against. Um, Leicester, but I would have kept Lichsteiner at left back. I know you kind of kill what you've got with the with the left footed balance, but you keep Granite in the middle where he's better. You also worry less about the protection Aubameyang is going to give you because he is a, a proper defender. And to be fair to Granite, barring the penalty, which I know we're going to come on to, he actually had a good game. So this isn't a criticism of him, but I just don't agree with him being there. I think you lose so much. Yeah, oh yeah, I'm Granite sorry. Being there. Yeah. Oh look, and I'll get in. We'll get in the um, our man of the matches later, but. Um, I think he had a good game as well. And when you've got your left back who, okay, he scored the penalty kick, and this leads into our next goal, where Abameyang, 56 minutes, so we go 2-1 two, two, up. Who was the corner from? Okay, before before we go there, sorry, sorry, Tony, for interrupting. Just before we go there, Tez, what what were your what was your take on the celebration? Because we've heard two opposing views, and of course, for different reasons. Mate, what did you make of all of that? I, I don't. I'll be honest, Swin. I don't read too much into any of their celebrations, mate. I, I used to get in. I used to try and read into them a bit, and then they come out and say it means something entirely different to what everybody else was thinking. So I, I just don't read too much into it, man. Um, Fair yeah, enough. yeah. I, I don't. I don't get too too worried about it. I don't. I don't look at their celebrations too much. I, you know. 
Um, you know, when he done that one in the World Cup, uh, what was that one where he... Kosovo, uh, the Albanian. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the then, Albanian eagle. Yeah, and mate, I, I'll be honest, I didn't even know what he was fucking talking about, so... Some political politician fucking thing, and I was like, well, I got no idea what he's even on about. So, um, <laughs> so I just don't get too bogged down in it, mate. No, that's fair. Uh, yeah, I mean, I didn't either. I mean, I mean, obviously Tony's opinion there has has a nuance to it, and and you can understand based on that that logic. I I, I don't think it was you know anything anything related to that. But of course the game of opinions, I thought it was just a simple gesture of, of, of fate. Not, not that he was kept in the team, but the fact that he's been given an additional responsibility of set pieces, maybe to a degree. And maybe it's something they, they've spoken about, you know, uh, from that angle, obviously when you have a direct free kick and you have a shot at goal, you take that shot. And it, that's not a magic recipe, but maybe from that sort of angle, which is very acute, uh, they've been practicing in in training or or something to the tune of that. So m- my opinion to that was definitely much more simplistic than what than what Tony saw. Yeah, uh, since you bring up that, I, and before we get on to this Abemian goal, um, do you remember a couple of weeks ago when he he done a f- had a free kick and and I almost think we would, we discussed it on the podcast where Özil said something along the, the rumour goes, Ozil said something, just go for the go for goal. I've seen you do this that was, in training. Yeah, I think that was Newcastle, wasn't it? Yeah. Newcastle. I just think ever since then he's got the he's just got confidence from that. And I don't, I just get this feeling that he I, I knew before he even kicked it I thought he's gonna go for goal there and he's gonna score. And I just felt that his confidence has been boosted, and I think that was may have been the changing moment. Like I could, I could be talking out my ass too, but I just when Ozil come over and whispered in his ear against that Newcastle game, and he went for goal, he just seems to have a bit more confidence in taking them free kicks. Yeah, I mean, not just that. Of course, you know that sort of testament is is big when one of the best players at the club, if not the best player at the club, is coming and telling you that, but. You know, there has been a concerted effort in training. You know, we've obviously seen an influx of more training footage come out from from the Arsenal channels on YouTube, Twitter, whatever you have. And I remember one instance many weeks ago, even before Newcastle, that Granit was the one taking these free kicks in training. And there were others lined up as well, but he was the one hitting targets and beating the goalkeeper more often. You know, he's obviously taking more corners now, uh, something again that Mesut Ozil was in, in charge of doing. So... The, it seems as if Emery likes the way Granit delivers balls, and obviously we know that he has the ability to pick a player out, you know, 40, 50 yards away from himself. But even in in congested situations, I think the way Granit puts pace on a ball and directs his ball is uh, is, is different. And you know, Mesut Ozil is more of a is a player who likes to guide the ball and maybe loft the ball, but Granit gets a bit more pace on his on his shots and and his passes. And you know, you need that sort of delivery in those situations. So. I don't think it's it should, it should come as a surprise that that he's been vested with this responsibility. Yeah, I agree. Um, so anyway, so the Abemian goal, Tony, fifty six minute, and it was it was from a granite Shaka corner. Now that was an interesting one because it, it screamed across the front of the goal, and oh, there was a bit of controversy. Was did Lacazette get a hit into that? Yeah, clearly. Like, I as soon as he'd done it, before the ball had even reached the Bamiyan and gone back in there, I said handball. Like, just natural reaction, I said handball. And then we scored, and everyone's celebrating. And the kid two rows in front of me went, that was handball. And I went, I said to him, I'm so glad you said that, because I thought I was going crazy. It, <laughs> yeah, for me, okay. it was so obvious. Yeah. And I, I don't know, but I mean, saying that, having watched it back... In the in the crowd, it looked like it just came off Lacazette's hand and, and it's got through to the back post and the Bamiyang's put it in. Um, but obviously, it did take a touch off Aiyu's head, which makes it a lot harder decision for the ref. But for me, it looked clear. I was amazed that the, the whistle didn't go. Even the Palace players' protest, you knew something could happen. And then obviously, we've got the... I don't want to say luck of goal line decision because there's no luck involved. It's fact. It's either over or it's not. Mm. But I think that's the tightest... Uh, margin the goal line decision systems ever given a goal by it was less than a centimetre did you yeah um, 
you were watching on TV, Schwinn. Did they bring up the goal line technology on the coverage you were watching? They did. It was it was brought out, you know, after the after play had resumed. It was not right after. Yeah, and, okay. uh, yeah. yeah. I think it was nine millimeters, and they showed the graphic. And I mean, I, I say it's nine millimeters, but you know, obviously, I learned about that later on as I was watching that graphic. I mean, it, it couldn't have been any closer, possibly. And you know, I mean, just just to talk on that that handball, I think Peter Drury brought up a good point that was was that intentional or not? I think, of course, we all can agree that the ball did strike his arm, uh, but the arm was in a very unnatural position. And what what Peter was talking about there was was he sort of raising his arm to to maybe ask for a foul? Was he shoved? I mean, you know, I haven't seen a replay of the incident, so I'm not quite sure. I but I've. I've watched it back because I've seen that viewpoint from a lot of people on Twitter. And for me, they're just trying to make a reason for their guy handballing it because he's flicked. The, not only has his hand gone up, he's flicked it on towards goal. You don't appeal in a certain di- the di- other direction to where the referee is. So if he's appealing, where, why is he appealing to the fans? They're not there. Oh, the only thing I could look, and I'm not, oh, okay, it was very lucky. Okay, For me, it was a handball. But I'm just thinking the other side of the argument was the ball did come in very quickly and you could nearly say it was a, as an accidental handball. Never in a million years. It's not an accident when your hand's above your head. Mm, true. Yeah, I was just thinking we can argue. Look, I, I, I agree, it's a handball. I everyone else, but I'm not going to sit here and make excuses for why he did it. or I, I'm not calling him a cheat, but it was handball. There's no... As I said, I've seen so many people going all different ways around the houses to invent excuses for why he done it or he may have done it because of this. And, and the one Schwinger said, I've, I've seen loads. But as I said, if he's appealing, you, the referee was behind him. So if he'd have punched the ball backwards, you could half go, oh, he was putting his hands up and looking towards the ref. And he may have been being fouled. It's, he was being held, but it's one of them at corners everyone gets held. But for me, I think we're just looking for excuses when in reality we've just got to say, look, you have all it. Yeah, yeah no, I agree. I agree. Can um, we also just take yeah. a second to appreciate what Aubameyang did there? I mean, such a tight situation. Um, you know, as you said, Tez, the ball came in, the ball was fizzed in, and it had a you know a couple of change of changes of direction in there. So it's not an easy ball to get to, but Aubameyang did so well to get goal side of his defender and just you know just po- poke it home. I mean, you know, by that obviously by that margin, but a goal's a goal. And, you know, for for as bad as a day we had, you know, I think the f- first 10, 15 minutes of the second half, we were we were on top of our game and Palace just didn't know what hit them. So credit where it's due, you know, we, we're obviously going to split hairs about how things went bad yesterday. But, you know, w- when the team performed well, we obviously were unplayable for them. Yeah, he's, he's brilliant at them. Um, he's just, we've said it a thousand times. And, and look, credit to him, mate, don't get me wrong, but... Fuck, he's good at what he does on them. <laughs> you know, like when them balls come in like that, you can guarantee you Bem Yang's on the on the on the end of them. So he's weird from from corners. He always just like hangs out at the back post, and it looks like he's not really involved. And he always ends up unmarked. It's I, I know. I try and watch him. I try and watch him and think, where is he? Where is he? And then I take my eye off him for a second and think, fuck, he scored. <laughs> like, he literally amazing. obviously again I can see the whole pitch and I'm not just talking about yesterday I'm just talking about in general and he just stands maybe three yards outside the far post maybe eight or nine yards out from goal isn't a threat and it's it seems like defenders forget he's allowed to move mm. because it's just like they leave him it's like mm. and then and then suddenly he's always in the right place and you've got to credit his movement for that but it's weird you think someone who okay he's not an aerial threat because he doesn't want to head of the ball yeah. but you think defenders would or teams would learn that this guy is always dangerous, so don't worry about like mark him. Even if he's not a threat in the first phase, he's he may be a threat in the second phase. So yeah, he's like, a worry. don't don't worry about maybe he won't win the header. Just follow him. It's weird. I remember he scored a very similar, got not similar, but in the same sort of way against Stoke at home last year, where we had a corner from the same side actually, and he just he was just standing at the back post. And the ball came to him and he scored. And there was no one within five yards. And it was from a corner. And you think he's our most likely to score. And there's no one within five yards of him. So it's mm. weird. Mm. No, he's fucking good at what he does. Um, now, quickly, boys, we got, I got a bit excited about that fucking granite goal. Um, so I'll just touch quickly going back. So Licksteiner came on. Bellerin went off. Do we know the extent of Bellerin's injury, Tony? 
Uh, no, I know he came back on the pitch at the end of the game to applaud the fans. So hopefully that indicates there's nothing too bad. But no, no idea. Okay. You haven't heard anything, Shoy? Uh, I read what Emery, I didn't watch the press conference at the game, but I, I did read the full quote. Um, for people looking for this quote, they can go to Football London. Uh, I don't think the Arsenal website has the full quote. I think the, the quote on there is a bit more cautious. But what Emery said was that it's a muscle injury. It's not as bad as it's uh, as it seemed early on. Um, to me, it seemed quite optimistic, but it's a muscle injury. So we don't know, uh, you know, usually a muscle injury can keep you out for, for two to four weeks, depending on what it is. Uh, he didn't have crutches on. He was limping when he left the stadium. So that's, again, a, a positive. Uh, I definitely don't expect to see him against Blackpool. Uh, even if he was fit, he probably wouldn't feature then. Uh, but I'm optimistic. I'm keeping my fingers crossed for Liverpool. I hope he'll be able to make it back then because we obviously are deficient in our fullback positions. But I wouldn't be entirely surprised if he is fit either. Yeah, okay. Um, now, this was a bit of controversy. This would have pissed you right off, Schwinn. <laughs> and I think both of you have got something to add on to this. Uh, Denny Welbeck on, Merzel Ozil off. 68th minute, well, Schwinn. What what pissed me off was not the reaction. You know, uh, I'm just going to go on for that a bit more because if he comes off and he just goes and sits on the bench, then people will say he doesn't care. If he throws his gloves to the ground, which is what he did, then people say he's he's pissed uh, at the manager or or at himself. I think it's more being pissed with himself maybe because he couldn't affect the game. Maybe he is pissed with the manager that he that he was brought off. But you have to see why that's the reason. And I think. That brings me on to the second point, which is he was the one that was fresh uh, from from our midweek trip. He didn't play at all. Obviously, he made the, the trip out there, but he didn't play uh, as opposed to some of the other players out there. And with Granit Xhaka at left back, he was the only one who could maybe bring some control to midfield. Uh, you know, I've seen a lot of people say that we were bullied in midfield. I think the Sky Pundit said the same thing. I thoroughly disagree with that. I think we just didn't have control in midfield. Uh, in, in major parts of the game. And when you look around, who is the one who's going to give you that? It's going to be Mesut Ozil, especially with Granit at left back. So I think the disappointment is is a bit more nuanced than that. And it's not just that he was pissed with the manager. I think it's because he knew that he didn't affect the game as he could. Uh, coming off the Leicester game, you know, he was on a high and probably wanted to do a bit more. But uh, I don't think he was as influential as he can be. And I don't think it's anything to do with being, you know, being in a tussle with the manager, it's more about disappointment and, and maybe questioning the manager to an extent as to why take me off when you need control in midfield. And I think that's a question that still needs answering. Mm, you got anything to add on that, Tony? I, I think it was arguably his worst decision since he's been Arsenal manager. I think, as, as Schwinn said, you, you lose all control. It's like look, the second half against Chelsea, Ozil and, um, and, and Xhaka got taken off. And neither of them had great games, but it showed that we literally did not control the ball after that. And then yesterday, Jack is obviously out on the left and you take Ozil off. And again, from the moment Ozil went off, we did not have any control of the game. I got into an argument with someone in the stands. because I said, I don't really care how much people moan at him for thinking he doesn't run or he doesn't try. That shows exactly the reason why you need him on the pitch. And it also brings when people go, oh, but he didn't get in a goal or an assist. But the control he brings you is unparalleled to what any other Arsenal player can do. I love Danny Welbeck. Everyone knows that. And Danny Welbeck, it was a come on. But it's still, for me, probably the worst individual decision that, that Emery's made. I think against Chelsea, when he made the similar decision, there's more of an argument because Xhaka was on a booking and standout awful that day. And, and Ozil was very bad that day. But yes, I don't even think Ozil was bad. I'd say quiet, but he didn't do much or anything wrong. As I said earlier, he could have had an assist had Bellerin uh, converted the chance better. And, and then suddenly you're looking at a complete different way way of viewing what he done. Uh, I think it was a horrendous decision, and especially in bringing Danny on, because who goes at 10? Like It ended up with Danny going at 10, basically. And you're like, I mean, you can argue you try to change it to a 4-4-2, but when you've got no control of a game, which we didn't have, you want players that can keep the foot on the ball. And, and Danny isn't that. Going to a 4-4-2 when, when another team's chasing the game, gives them the opportunity to keep the ball because they had three in the middle so they could outnumber us. It was just, it was a weird, weird decision. Very weird, yeah. I agree. Just, 
as I said, that, like, and, and people are going to criticise Ozil how they want, and I'm not one that particularly defends him all the time. But for me, just what you're losing by taking him off, it, it was a stupid, stupid decision. Mm-hmm. Um, look, another one that blew me away a little bit was then Abemian came off and Ramsey went on. And, and uh, I just... I think I was a bit pissed, you know. I, I seen Ozil go off, and then so I'm I'm seeing the creator go off, and then I see Abemian go off, and I'm thinking, there's the fucking goal scorer going off, and we're replacing with Ramsey, and with all due respect to you, Tony, but Welbeck, and I'm like, what the fuck is going on? But not even I agree with you, and and not even that. When that happened, I thought. When I saw the board go up and it was a Bamiang, I thought, brilliant, he's realised this 4-4-2 isn't going to work because we've got no control of the ball. And um, Danny's going to go left. Iwobi's going to stay right, lacquer up top, and Ramsey in at a 10 or even drop slightly deeper and go 4-3-3. Nope. Still went 4-4-2. Ramsey in the weirdest right position I've ever seen because he didn't want to be there. Iwobi, who had his worst game in a long time, stayed on on the left. And it was just like, at what point do you realise this isn't working? And... The, apparently the point is he didn't. He didn't, and I, I, yeah, it's. I also, don't know. as well, Aaron Wan-Bissaka got man of the match on Sky, I believe. I didn't watch it, but I'm, I'm told he did. On um, on match of the day, they had a st- uh, like, they basically always highlight one player they think was excellent, and it was Aaron Wan-Bissaka. On who scored, who usually are opinions different to everyone else because it's a stats-based model. Mm-hmm. Uh, Aaron won, Bissaka got man in the match. And at no point did we try and do anything to counteract that. So everyone could see he played well. Whether you think he's man in the match or not is a different story. But from the ground, I could see he played well. I looked on Twitter after. Everyone said, oh, what a game one Bissaka had. Mm. We've done nothing to try and change that. Mm-hmm. It, and, and then going 4-4-2, it, I, I don't. I, literally, I don't understand any of the decisions made up. And I know people are going to go, oh, you've won however many games in a row and now you're criticising him. I'm not saying I think he's a bad manager or blah, 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 but when I think stuff's gone wrong, I'm going to say it. And when I think stuff's gone right, I'll say that as well. So sometimes we'll lose a game and I'll praise some of the decisions he's made and say I can see why he made them. But the thing is, when you don't win and he makes mistakes, he's got to be called out, out on them. You can't say, oh, he made mistakes, but it's all right because the last 11 games went well. Mm. No, I agree. And, and like you said, when you've got Grenard at left back, You've got the wizard in fucking, you know, trying to do what he can to weave his magic. And you've got your goal scorer at a Bamiang. And, and don't get me fucking started on Lacazette, because he's had the fucking most easiest ride of any fucking Arsenal player in the world. So I'm not even putting Lacazette into the equation. So you've taken a Bamiang off who's scored probably 16 from 8 or something. I don't know. It's, it's a fair few fucking goals. He's top, scorer. he's top scorer in the league now, and he's only played two games up front and he only played an hour of each of them games up front yeah so so you know very good fucking stats and you've got Ozil and you've taken them off and you what, what were we at that stage uh, we were in front 2-1 two, one. Yeah, like, two one not up. a big fucking lead and let's bring me in to our uh, did you want to add anything onto that Schwinn no, I mean, no. as you guys said, that there's a lot of questionable decisions made there and it, it stinks of the Chelsea game you know in, in a lot of ways and for entirely wrong reasons. As Tony said, Granit had a yellow against Chelsea at Stanford Bridge. And, and to an extent, Mesut wasn't working as hard as Emery probably wanted him to. So those subs were justified. Uh, yesterday, that was not the case. And I mean, I'll, I'll just segue quickly into the, the last goal. And there again, Lacazette, you know, making the mistake, giving the ball away from, from a position of, of our advantage to, you know, trying to find Torreira, who's, our, who's at the base of the midfield, essentially, with, with a very, very clumsy ball. And if, if you would rewind your memories to Stamford Bridge, Lacazette was the one who gave the ball away to Hazard, I think it was, that led to Marcus Alonso's winning goal. And that's exactly what happened. You know, Aaron Ramsey's completely out of position. Uh, we know he can be an asset, but we also know he's ill-disciplined. And when you play him out of his out of a defined role, then you're giving him even more license to, to do as he would. And that's exactly what he did. Caught up field, um, you know, Crystal Palace players charging at us and, you know, we gave away a penalty. So it was just a lot of questionable decisions that led to that whole situation. And anyone who watched the game would probably have thought that the substitutions would be made, you know, in completely in a different way. I, I think 
a lot of what you said is right, but blaming Ramsey or even mentioning Ramsey there, I, I think is a bit ridiculous, really, because one, he was playing right wing, so you kind of expect him to be forward. You had Torreira pretty much 30 yards out. You had Guendouzi on the right wing, like in the area, who were both meant to be deeper than Ramsey. So if you're going to call people out for being not in their defined role or too far forward, you have to definitely look at Guendouzi and arguably Torreira. For me, I, I, I think Ramsey's sort of being made a scapegoat because of the contract situation. Not, but I mean in general, I'm not saying by you. Because, yeah, we know he wanders out of position, but if you're going to mention players out of position, there was probably six of them. And look, we had, we're two one up with 10 minutes to go. We had six players within 30 yards of their goal. That's not Ramsey's fault. Ramsey, no, I, mean, I, I, I didn't. I didn't mean to single Ramsey out. I'm just saying if you play him out <laughs> of a defined role. You, <laughs> you know, had me it, thinking too, Shwen. I'm thinking, what the fuck? Did I miss something here? <laughs> no, I mean, it was it was a comedy of errors. You know, it's, yeah, not, it was, it's yeah. one error leading to the other. You know, Lacazette gives the ball away. I mean, for, for one, it will be could have probably done a bit better as well. Maybe instead of finding Lacazette there uh, and putting him in a cul-de-sac, maybe retain the ball, take the ball towards the corner flag. You know, then, then like I said, plays a, a clumsy ball to Torreira, who's caught in, in no man's land, essentially. Guendouzi's out of the picture. Uh, you know, he's nowhere to be found. Mustafi could have brought down a, a Palace player charging at us. That's the you worst know, decision for me. It, yeah, like, I mean, it, there's a the lot crowd. of things oh. going wrong there. And I, I didn't mean to single out Ramsey at all, but it, it's just the team cohesion at that point was non-existent. It, it was negative if that exists. Well, that goes back to the manager. Because exactly. He that, made, that he made it that. Yeah, he made it like that, like you say. So, um, and I said to Tony at the time, it might have been this morning, Tony. I said to you, like, if anyone, bo- you know, okay, Granite gave away that late penalty, but if anyone's fucking um, having a shot at him, you know, over that, they can go and get themselves fucked. But I think you <laughs> you said to me that I, you haven't seen too much hate from it, which was good because. You know, he's playing left back, and okay, we we know he's not left back, but that could have happened to anybody too. And I'm questioning whether it was even was a fucking penalty, you know. Well, that's that's the big debate. So, hmm. um, anyway, boys, uh, you want to go through a man of the match? Well, just Schwinn. Was it a penalty? Well, I'll be honest. When I when I watched it uh, in real time. Um, I, I thought it was a stonewall penalty. No, no questions asked. They showed, I think, one replay of the game uh, of the incident, and you know I, maybe it was just dejection at that point. I, I was least interested, and I thought it was a penalty. But having interacted with some people on Twitter afterwards, having seen a few more replays of the incident, I think it's a dive. Uh, it, you know, Granit does well to sort of stay on his feet, and and he pulls his leg out of the challenge. I think that was just that one, you know, centimeter of contact, maybe, if that's the right unit. And, and Zaha, you can tell by the way he, you know, uses his both feet to to swan dive, essentially. He, he was looking for it and he got it. So, you know, I, I just pulled up this stat that someone put on Twitter that this decade, Arsenal have only beaten one team, Sunderland, away from home with Martin Atkinson refereeing. So, you know, make of that what you will, but... Having seen replays, not a penalty. Never in a million years for me. Yep. Um, in the ground, not a single complaint. Thought it was a penalty. Uh, Granite came out after the game and said it was a penalty. Having seen replays and after reading everyone's views on Twitter before I'd seen the replays, I still think it's a penalty. Um, yes, he's brought it. And I don't particularly think Jack has made a mistake, but... Once your leg's out there, it's not the striker's or the attacker's job to get out of the way of it. And it's, it's, that's a horrible statement, but that's the way football's gone in the last 10 years. 20 years ago, a player would have rode that tackle and gone on and carried on and got to the byline. But the way football's gone, and it's been a long time, it's not even been the last one or two years, it's the last 10, 15 years, that a dangled leg is a target to go over now. If someone is impeding you in the box, and I use the word impeded intentionally, go over. And I think we saw a couple of weeks ago, was it at Watford, where Lacazette tried to stay up and end up fluffing the ball into the side net and we didn't get anything. Uh, Had Zaha carried on and and lost his balance a bit and stumbled towards it and not quite got to the ball, everyone would be saying, why didn't he go down? So I think he brought it, but I still think it's a penalty. Hmm. 
I'm still. I can under, I can understand the viewpoint saying it's not. I'm not saying I'm right and everyone else is wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I still. Yeah. Mm. I would Tez? want it the other way around for sure. Mm. I'm still. Questioning, would you make up a test? I, I'm still questioning whether it was a penalty. And that's what I said at the start. I'm. You know, I, I'm I don't think it was a penalty. Um, myself, but yeah, but I mean, I could be a little bit biased too, though, Schwinn. Oh, really? Well, I mean, we, 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 all, we all are, and I think a similar incident happened in in the in the late kickoff yesterday. No, no, I mean Arsenal, Arsenal wise, Tony. I didn't mean Granite wise. So. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, the same thing happened. John Moss gave a penalty to Man United yesterday for a challenge on Martial, which was again very similar. If anything, that was you know less of a penalty because. Uh, Idris Aganage got got a foot onto the ball, but I think you know you make your own luck in a lot of these situations, especially late on into games, which is what happened against us. And you know Zaha is someone who is vulnerable in those situations of of making the most of it. And you know coming into the game, I think everyone was suspecting a lot of trouble for for Granit in particular with Townsend and Zaha taking turns on him. And and as you boys said, he did pretty well for the majority of the game, but at that point you have to be a bit more careful. Um, and, you know, I think Granit, by his comments, sort of just, you know, made made himself OK with the fact that he gave a penalty instead of accusing Zaha of, of essentially diving there, which is I mean, let's be honest, he dove there. He made the most of it, but he dove there with the slightest bit of contact, which in a way is conning the ref, which for me is cheating and is a dive. Uh, I can understand why the penalty was given, especially in real time. But having seen it again and again, I think there has to be some steps taken to curb this. Mm. Well, this is, I remember we played Chelsea at home last year, we drew 2-2. And we had this, I don't want to say argument, we had this debate then. And I agree that basically the rules become if there's contact, go down. It's, a, it's not a dive if there's contact. That's now the, the common belief. Oh, I got touched, so it wasn't a dive. For me, that's the problem. But as long as it is how it is, then you can't blame players for playing to that rule. And I remember I actually said it at the time in criticism of, of Jack. Um, he went down against Chelsea, he was on the booking. And it, they said, oh, it wasn't, it was a dive, it was a clear dive. But because someone had touched him, it was, oh, no, it can't be a dive. And then Hazard got the penalty in the same game. Um, and again, he got touched. Was it enough to go down? Was it fuck? But the rule has become somehow that if you're touched, it can't possibly be a dive. That. And look, and then players have been clever with it, and they make the contact. So there's a case to say Zaha made the contact with with Xhaka. So it's it's a difficult one, but for me, as I said, for me, it's a it's a penalty. It's not his job to get out of it. And I think if refs gave penalties when people stayed up on their feet more, players would be more inclined to do so. But they never do. So players have got to do what they've got to do. And just for clarity, I think the Man United one was a penalty as well. Um, <laughs> I didn't say that one. <laughs> Just, but but to go on, like to move on now, because that for me, like okay, we finished the game at a two-two draw. That's the eighty-third minute. Yes, whether you say Granite gave away the penalty, whether you say it was a dive or what it was, that wasn't the moment we lost the game, though, or drew the game for me. We lost the game. Well, we 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 dropped the points with the subs for yeah. me. I, I I was just about to say. Back probably, you know, there was lots of things in this game that just didn't add up. I think that was um, Lacazette did fuck all once again. Um, I think last week I said he did nothing and Schwinn said to me, it's usually a bit harsh. And I'm like, mate, he didn't do a lot for me last week. And I stick by it again this week. And I don't want to be on a Lacazette bashing, but fuck me, what's the bloke, what's the bloke got to do to get a bit of criticism? Like if he's not playing a good game, we're gonna ha- you got to criticise a player. You can't sit there and go, oh yeah, he's a fucking legend. This player, let's go. You know, like if he's shit, he's shit. Simple as that. I hope he comes out next week and scores a fucking hat trick. But from what I seen of him yesterday, he was fucking absolute shit. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. For me, it's his worst game of the season. Well, I was gonna say worst, but I was trying to think of if there was another one, so I didn't want to say that. <laughs> I can't remember. He's had a few rough ones. So. Yeah. I think the thing is, is the, the issue with Lacazette, and as I always say, his link-up play is very good. Yesterday, that didn't come into it because we didn't control the ball enough. But you can't rely on him to score that chance. And, and people still claiming he's a deadly finisher. Look, he's just not. I would love him to be. Um, and so the issue is with him, if he's not 
finishing the chances that he's getting and then his link up play isn't as good as or just isn't involved in the game for whatever reason you, you're left with with work rate basically and and that's not enough for a uh, someone who's playing up front on their own I dare say had Aubameyang been playing up top you wouldn't have got the link up either because he's not he's not capable of doing it but when he had that chance that Lacazette put wide early on I, I, I would fully expect that Aubameyang to score that and and that's that's where you get the difference I, I think for me I think Lacazette needs to take these chances more because sometimes games are decided upon you get one chance and you, you've got as a someone who's playing up front on their own as a nine you've got to score them chances I don't want to get too much on his back because I think he has been good in a lot of games this season. But oh, he's playing good, that, yeah. Yeah, that, that was his worst performance and he needs to be working. He had two against Watford, uh, not Watford, sorry, Leicester as well. He missed two very good chances from inside the six-yard box. He has to be more clinical. And as I said, people are kidding themselves into, th- into saying he is because they want him to be and I want him to be. But again, we've got to be honest. He misses mm. too many chances. Yeah, that's right. Um, boys, I might have just before we get into our who who would your best was. Um, so Emery has come out. He said I'm disappointed with the result, but our work is good. We drew. It's not bad. It's getting better. Blah blah blah. Uh, two penalties against us in the box. It was difficult action for defence. Uh, Granite is playing left back. He's better in the middle. That's what we like to hear. So he's actually come out and said that Granite is better off in the middle. So that m- might just mean that Granite goes back to playing in the middle, which is something we'd rather rather all hear. Because after your thirty second summary of Sporting Lisbon, Tony um, Granite was also playing left back there, and by the sounds of it, we were very flat as well. So it might be oh, good to get some creativity. Didn't have anything to do, and not not, not good or bad. Against Lisbon, Xhaka had absolutely nothing to do. Mm. Um, who was your best? Uh, fucking what a tough decision. Probably Torreira. Schwinn? He, he broke up. He broke up a lot, but that's because we they had a lot of the ball, so you'd expect them to. Yeah. Yeah. Toss a coin between Torreira and Granite. Yeah, I'm going to go Granite. My coins cost tossed. I probably would have had he not given away the penalty and I know he's not a left back and and so you can't overly blame him but the fact is he did give away a penalty would have been 2-0 if he wasn't playing well you weren't (laughs) giving away a penalty yeah true (laughs) no I said I I think he had a good game and but look at (laughs) a a game make game deciding this like fat incident and he had two at one end, but then he had one at the other end that, that probably cost the well did cost us. Hmm. Um, what's the stadium like there? Uh, it's old. The view's not the best. Um, they've got a reputation for being very loud. They're not. They can be, but they tend not to be. Uh, I don't know. I don't really know how else to to sell it. It's decent. It's it's more it's more old school. And a lot of people like the old school grounds because I've said on here before that Leicester, Southampton, they're all becoming the same. It's just a bowl with different coloured seats depending on what team you're at. Whereas Palace is old school. It does have a bit of character. Um, one end's only got a very small stand with them boxes above it and the other end is a double tier stand. So it's, it's like not at all symmetrical. Um, it's decent. It is decent. 20. But yeah, the view's always hampered with that type of ground, same as Everton. 25,718 attendants. Is that a that a good crowd? Silly. Uh, it looked pretty full. I couldn't see many empty seats. I'd imagine that's around there. Mm, there, yeah, there. Full. yeah, right. Hey, right, boys. Um, yeah, fuck, we've been waffling on about going for about 50 minutes. We better get into some live callers and some questions, eh? Each and every week we're joined by our listeners and you too can join us on Skype. You can find our link uh, for our Skype chat in our bio on Twitter. Um, this week we've got Vish. How are we, Vish? Uh, good news, guys. Yeah, good, mate. Good. What do you got for the boys? Uh, just a quick question. I want to know, what, did fatigue have a, this, uh, a factor in our game? Because we seem to get overpowered in the middle of the park where... The, these guys just overran us, uh, which is quite worrying, especially since we got Liverpool coming up. And we know they are a phys- uh, physical team. 
and a hard running team which will not tire come second half. So, is Emery's persistence in playing the same uh, same formation, the same team, gonna also be detrimental to our upcoming match? Tony. Yeah, for me, I think it's massive. He prides himself on on having a fit team, and I think this running stats show running stats show we've been we've ran more than anyone else in the league, and so you can read into it that we're fitter, and it's probably why we've won so many games in the last twenty to thirty minutes. But fitness is only so good if you're doing less work than everyone else. The issue is we're, we're playing the same give or the same basis of a team every week. So they may be fitter, but then they're doing so much more work that it kind of cancels itself out. We were running on empty towards the last 20 minutes yesterday. But then it makes sense when you think about it. If you look, they played, since they last played, we've played three times. Well, that was our third. And pretty much all of the players played on on Monday. All of them traveled on Thursday. Some played a big part, some played no part at all. Some came on the subs. And then obviously we've gone into that game away on a heavy pitch where it had been raining heavily before the game. So for me, fatigue played a big part, and he has to learn to to juggle his um, to juggle his squad. It's going to be the same this week. Liverpool are out of the Carabao Cup, so they've not got a fixture. So again, it we would have played twice between Liverpool playing and us playing them. Uh, I expect them to rotate very heavily in the in the Carabao Cup. Hopefully, no one that's going to start against Liverpool will be in the team. But he seems to be trying to win every game, which in a way is a good thing. But I think it'll be detrimental in in the long term. Yeah, but in so in and I agree totally with you, Tony. But um, you got to keep in mind also Crystal Palace, them them front, you know the, the the they're a fast team. Like, well, the front three are anyway. You know, they're pretty quick and keep you on your toes and a bit of fatigue and you know look what happened. I suppose. Yeah, well, that's that's part of it. Is 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 that due to tiredness? But it's not that. I mean, Lacazette looked knackered. I, I think he had a bad game, but he looked shattered. It will be looked knackered. Um, Torreira looked absolutely gone by about the 70th minute. He, he, I don't know if it was he was doing more work than usual because he seemed to be getting up and down a bit more, but he looked absolutely fucked. Mm. So, and you got to think he. I know he only played 20 or 25 minutes the other day, but he still had to travel to Portugal, and that's a day where he'd usually be lying in bed. Hector Bellerin again didn't play on Thursday, but travelled. Why I don't get if you're not going to play the players, don't don't take them. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know obviously hindsight's brilliant. You can say, oh, we might have needed them, but I just think it's stupid making players travel every week, playing your strongest team every week. I mean, as I said, I'm looking forward to the to the Carabao Cup game, but in, against Brentford in the last round, Torreira ended up playing a half. Lacazette came on and scored the winner. You don't need them type of players in these games and. They may be fitting than everyone else, but while they're doing more work than any everyone else, it isn't going to count for anything. Mm-hmm. Um, you got any to add there, Schwinn? I mean, I'll just quickly add, because I agree with you guys, I'll just quickly add what we spoke about earlier in the show, which was taking off Mesut Ozil. You know, Tony said that it was probably one of his worst decisions he's made so far. And you take off the player who, A, can give you control in midfield. Granted, we did not have control while he was on, but he, he was the one who could have given you control in midfield, especially considering Granit Xhaka was deployed at left back. And secondly, he was probably one of the more, you know, fresher players out there uh, con- concerning, you know, the, f- the fact that he didn't play in midweek. So, you know, this was a very questionable game plan that Emery tried to execute and I mean, let's not forget, we were quite close in terms of winning the game. And, you know, I mean, a late penalty, we didn't look very confident. We didn't look very good, but we were still within a shout of winning the game. And if it wasn't for that penalty, we we probably would have come away with the three points. But that is an excuse to performance and, and the, the, the drop in energy levels. So it, it was a bit shocking in terms of how he took off certain players. Um, you know, Danny Welbeck comes on and he's not on the left. I I think most of us imagine that Lacazette would be the one coming off or maybe it will be. And then you would deploy Danny Welbeck on the wing, maybe on the left to cover for, for Granite and let Aubameyang take the spot up top. That didn't happen. So apart from managing the squad, even managing the game yesterday was quite quite difficult for me to, to, to witness because I think we know the squad better and you would expect Emery to squad, know the squad better at this point. Mm. Um, very hard to disagree there. Uh, any girls to add there, Vish? 
Uh, just that I don't understand why he couldn't have brought on after the second goal. I mean, you can see that your players are, are tiring in the game. Why not bring in Socrates to add a little more stability in the defense? Then he could have taken off a Bamiang or Lacazette. And was just, yes, I know they would they would be pushing the the Crystal Palace players more onto us, but perhaps it would also given uh, Socrates some time to bet into the pace of the game, which in time for Liverpool. Mm, I yeah, mate, good point. I, I'd also question, and I don't want to hang Emery Emery here, but. Um, you know, you've got Smith Rowe on the bench. Uh, you've also... Uh, and where's El Nenny? Is he, is he injured, Tony? Or, or I nearly thought he no, would have been on the he bench. Came off, he played against uh, Sporting and came off, didn't look injured. Yeah, I, um, just, I just don't think he's he's rotating enough. That's just my thoughts. Um, you know, Tuari, I, I agree. He looked, he looked absolutely buggered enough. And a Smith Rowe or a bloody El Nenny, you know, could have easily slotted into that position if they, were, if they, were, you know, uh, probably El Nenny over Smith Rowe. But yeah, I don't know. It was an interesting one. Hmm. Um, okay, Vish, is that all you got for us, buddy? No, yeah, that's it. Good on you, mate. Um, we'll catch up again oh. another time, eh? All right, take care, guys. Cheers, buddy. Bye. Yeah. Well, bye. boys we'll get into some uh questions because we've got heaps to get through once again and thank you everybody for your questions i've been asked before on youtube how do you get your questions in uh on twitter it's the best way because i'll find them so at clock end underscore talk um i do see your comments and whatnot come through on youtube but questions it is very hard to get uh facebook you can also find us on twitter because i'm too lazy to look at facebook so Keep them all in the one spot, and then we read down them. Um, so defence, uh, Tony, I'm sick of our fans going. Emery isn't scared of hooking big names, etc. Ozil and Ramsey are clear scapegoats. Why in the world did he sub Ozil and Abemiang? For fuck's sake, reeks of bottled Chelsea <laughs> second half. Criticising Emery draws a torrent of abuse. Abemiang and Granite left too risky. Pretty much what we said in the first 50 minutes. Yeah, I don't, I don't even know if that's a question or just a summarization of our last hour of a podcast. Yeah, he's uh, wrapped it up in about, what, 100 and something odd characters. So, um, we'll keep going, though. Uh, Savesh, can we talk about the fact that we cannot criticise Amri? Even his poor decisions yesterday led us to dropping points. Granite at left back was poor against Sporting. Surely we should have tried a youngster there or just played Licksteiner. Well, who else would we play there, Tony? As I said, I I personally would have played Licksteiner. Um, We then probably would have come into issues when Bellerin got injured, but we obviously didn't know that was going to happen before the game. Um, I also think had we played Licksteiner there on Thursday against Sporting, it probably would have got him more used to playing on the left because, let's be honest, he doesn't really play there. Um, I don't know too much about the youth teams and, and who plays left back. Um, so I, I'm not going to offer the name of a youth player who may or may not be a left back. Um, obviously Ainsley's not ready yet, but it is what it is. It's the, the decision he went with. And we're saying this, and I'm including myself in this, we're saying all of this in hindsight. Had we won that 2-1 and that penalty incident not happened, we'd have said, oh, granted, had a very good game at left back. And yeah, the subs maybe were a bit wrong, but we got away with it and we'll learn from it. So hindsight's obviously lovely. Um, as I said, it's a criticism as much of myself as, as any of the, the people asking the questions. Um, but I, I also agree, and I said it earlier, that we should be allowed to criticise. This is not us jumping on the bandwagon and saying, oh, shit, we never wanted him, blah, blah, blah. But as I said, when someone makes a mistake, you've got to, you've got to be able to say it. Otherwise, everything would be the same, and we'd just say brilliant. Everything's brilliant all the time. And the podcast would just be us turning on and saying, yep, he was brilliant, and then going home. <laughs> yeah, we won't do that. We're too honest. <laughs> um, Savesh, he's gone on a bit of a fucking rant here, and I don't mind it. Um, okay, so Savesh, where do we start with you, Betty? Can we talk about the fact that, yes, okay, we've done that. 
Uh, not going to say Xhaka had a bad game because he didn't, but he didn't play like a fullback, but like a midfielder. Well, he is a fucking midfielder. Then Emery took off Ozil, and that, that has been his worst decision as a manager until now, as we just said. Uh, we lost the control in the middle because Xhaka played left back and Ozil on the bench. Did we read all this before we fucking did this podcast, boys? This is about the first time people might actually agree with stuff I'm saying, it seems. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, shit. I was half expecting to get criticised from this. Um, I get that people want to give Emery time to adjust to the league and stuff, but when he comes, when he makes glaring mistakes, we should be able to point it out without getting abused. Tony? I'm just going to point out, I never read these questions. <laughs> and any regular listener will know I don't read these questions. I'm, actually, fucking bullshit. <laughs> I'm spinning out here. I'm thinking. <laughs> um, okay, let's get it going. Oh, I've never read these questions either. I'm just like, yeah. Okay, Savesh continues. Also. Wait, wait, wait. Wasn't, um, wasn't Tony saying that if I don't make the show, who he's going to echo? I think we just got an answer to that, don't we, Taz? <laughs> well, it doesn't help because Sarvesh was one of the ones that was calling me Echo as well. Don't think I didn't see you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, particularly helpful. <laughs> yeah, sprung, buddy. Um, also, can people stop saying that game was too physical for Ozil? Well, I haven't seen that one. He made Maguire and, and Diddy... Look shit against Leicester. Fuck's and Diddy. And Diddy. And Diddy. Oh, yeah, spell it wrong, that's right. Uh, this, this technique is good enough for him to get out of trouble and still creates chances. He didn't have the best games, but stopped making excuses for Emery's sub. Okay, well, that's Sarvesh's rant, and it's pretty much our fucking podcast, wasn't it? We should have yeah, just read the questions and <laughs> saved ourselves a time. <laughs> okay, the Texas Gooner. Ah, it's good to have him back. He also writes for us on the blog. Uh, is it time to redeploy Abemiang as the main striker? This one, let's go to you this one, Schwinn. Lacazette has struggled a bit up in the front of goal in the last few games. Does Lacazette's importance to our collective play outweigh his form in front of goal at current? Um, he goes on to say, to piggyback off other questions, does Ozil's recent deployment as Emery's number 10 help Abemiang's case to be brought back in the leading line? Take it away, Schwinn. These, these are very difficult questions because I think we, we all agree that Abemiang is a superior striker. You know, there is, there is no doubt the numbers speak for themselves. And to anyone who does not believe in statistics, you can still watch the games and tell that Abemiang has... You know, a superior output despite having fewer minutes under his belt. But does that fit in with Emery's style of playing? I'm not so sure. And, you know, yes, Lacazette had a really, really horrible time yesterday. But is one game enough to, to you know, just bat down his confidence and get him out of the team? Especially with Liverpool next week? I'm not sure that's the right, right way to go. You know, you want to show these players some love when they, when they struggle. And this might not be the consensus at this point, but I think Lacazette will retain his position. I'm not trying to atone him from his mistakes yesterday because obviously he was very bad. But at the same time, we need the collective firepower of all our top players. And, you know, that, that's probably going to be the way we beat Liverpool because we are still very much suspect at the back. So, I, you know, we all would want Aubameyang as a striker, Mesut Ozil behind him, maybe he will be on the left. And to Danny Welbeck's credit, I would probably give him a shot on the right. I think that's our most balanced uh, to, you know, a front four. But is it as lethal as having Lacazette in there? Maybe throw in an Iwobi or a Welbeck? I don't think so. And against Liverpool, we need our firing power. So maybe not next week. But if, if things don't click, especially in the first halves, I think Emery has to make a decision between Aubameyang and Lacazette. And for me, it has to be Aubameyang then. Yep, couldn't agree more with that one. Um, Brad's or original Brad's. Uh, why do you feel football fans are so hypocritical? Tony, Arsenal fans criticising uh, Merson for what he said. Oh, no, I, okay, I don't know what he said. So, uh, for what he said, but say the most vile things after a player makes a mistake or costs us goals. 
Do you know what he said to him? Uh, I think he said we're going to take a hiding off someone and get beat 5 or 6 nil. Only Fulham have a worse defence than us in the league. We're too open. We're bang average and we've just been basically bullying teams and beating the little teams. So that's obviously not a direct quote, but it was pretty much well, along yeah. those lines. Yeah, OK. Um, anyone else feel that with the current defenders we have, getting top four is a big achievement. Man for man, our defenders are poor and would maybe get into a top top team bench if lucky. What's your views on the top four being the best we can do with the, this defence, Tony? Yeah, I mean, top four is still the, where we're trying to get to for me. The, uh, uh, some people, I, for me, were getting carried away by winning 11 games in all comps in a row and suddenly thought we were title challengers. I never believed that. So I think top four is probably the best we can achieve with this defence. But I thought that in June, July, August, September, October, and I'll still think it in November and December. It The defence isn't good enough. But as I said, it's, it's what I expected. And I'm not trying to say, oh, I'm right all the time, blah, 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 because anyone that listens knows I'm fucking wrong all the time. But I, I don't know I don't know where the question's leading in that did he think that we was going to be title challengers? And that's not a criticism if he is. It's just a difference of opinion. But I, so I'll be honest, at the start of the season, I didn't see a single person say, oh, I think we're going to challenge for the title this year. Mm, no, it's, it's, I agree. It's... Um... What about the, uh, we didn't really answer, why do you feel football fans are so hypocritical? Arsenal fans criticising Merson for what he said. Uh, look, one, Merson or anyone on TV, they always sensationalise, they always go over the top uh, because, again, they've got an audience to cater to. And we react to that as fans uh, because it's clear he's gone over the top. If he had said Arsenal's defence aren't the best, they haven't played any of the top sides yet, so we don't really know where they're at. You could have probably gone, yeah, fair enough. But he's had to go over the top, and, he, and, he, and he's been a bit ridiculous. So then we react to that. And it's also a case of Merson said it to millions of people, obviously via a TV camera, whereas we think when we say it, and I'm, I tend to not go too over the top, but I probably have at times, and I know many people do, um, we feel like we're only saying it to the person we're directly in conversation with. But because of the way social media works and stuff like podcasting and vlogs and, and whatnot, it ends up being seen and heard by a lot more people. But I don't think we realise that when we say it. And I certainly don't. I say stuff on here. And then someone will pull me up on it a couple of weeks later and I think, how the fuck do you hear that? I was just talking to Tej and Schwinn. Uh, <laughs> I, I think we realise that they have a whole audience, but we think when we're speaking, we're speaking directly to whoever we're speaking to. Mm-hmm. Um, Gator Guna, for the most part, Schwinn, for the most part, we have been winning ugly. How should we set up against Liverpool? Do you have a chance? Do we have a chance of winning? I think we do have a chance of winning. I think Liverpool are nowhere near as impressive as they looked last season, and I think there, there, there's hope to there, there's there's scope to be optimistic. You know, if we can somehow get our fullbacks back, I think that's the number one step, both a left back and a right back in Hector Bellerin. And hopefully Nacho or, or Kolasinac will be available because a lot of Liverpool's threat comes down from the flanks, as we know. And and, and get a bit more sturdy midfield with, with Granit back in there with Lucas Torreira. I think another essential step is to heavily rotate, as Tony spoke earlier, for our Blackpool fixture and get these boys, you know, completely fresh. Um, on the weekend, I think I don't. I am not too worried about our front four, whoever they are. I think there's enough spark, enough creativity there to get something out of them. But obviously, the the issues lie deeper. Um, Socrates back will be helpful. Um, I'm not too worried about that. I think Holding's done well, but I do think Socrates can you know put in a better shift. I think there's <clears throat> I think there's hope to be positive. Mafropanus, when's he back? From all the reports that, <clears throat> excuse me, from all the reports that Arsenal have put out, there's no timetable on a return. Yeah, right. I wonder what he did because he's been out for seems like forever. Uh, he hasn't featured at all this season, has he? No. No, well, not in the first team, but I mean, is he play? He hasn't been youth or anything. No. No. Fuck it. Okay. Um. 
Do, do, do. That RC fella. Sorry about the tip on the weekend too, mate. <laughs> oh, I came second, didn't it? No, he fucking asked me for a tip on Saturday and I was out with the fucking fairies, mate. I was fucked. And um, I said, yeah, I'm a big fan of egg tart. Cunt ran fucking dead last by about ten and a half lengths. <laughs> oh, no, because you sent us on WhatsApp your mate's horse and I checked. I didn't back it. I checked and it came second. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that was another one, yeah. Yeah, um, my horse runs in a couple of weeks too. It's trialling tomorrow morning, actually. So, as much as I'd love to and criticise you for keep saying Winx is going to lose which it never will I doubt our audience care about Australian horse racing so no. probably get on with questions yeah I will <laughs> um, <laughs> it was just that RC fellow reminded me uh, really disappointed with uh, Merce I never said Winx is going to lose you always back against Winx <laughs> you kept telling me about the dolphin horse that's what he's going about <laughs> anyway really disappointed with uh, Ozil yesterday not his on pitch performance, but his glove throwing tanty. What what message is he trying to send? I don't get it, Tony. Uh, I agree with Schwinn earlier. I, I think it's more frustration at himself because he, he walked off the pitch. He, he shook a couple of people's hands on the way past. He greeted Emery as he walked past. And you'd think if it was direct anger at him, he would show it in front of him, not after he's shaken his hand or hugged him or whatever he'd done. So I think it's just more... Maybe frustration at himself, maybe frustration at the situation. He didn't have the best of games. He wasn't deeply involved. He probably still felt fresh and strong because, as we said, he had midweek off or he didn't play. So he probably felt like he had a lot more to give and, and he was just frustrated at the situation. For me, I'd rather see that. I don't want to see players. Look, it's a different story for 3 4 nil up and the player comes running off celebrating. But you should be annoyed at coming off, especially if you haven't impacted the game in the way you know you can, it's a, it's, a, it's a missed opportunity. So, I mean, I see no problems in that. Um, I would probably see an issue if it was in front of Emery, but for me, that 4 5 three make a big difference. If he's walking off the pitch and he throws his gloves at Emery and he just walks past him and ignores him, then for me, that's different. He's showing the huge disrespect to the guy who's his manager, who's in charge of him. But the way he done it, for me, I see absolutely nothing wrong with it. I know those guys are professional sportsmen, and but but think of yourself as when you were a kid growing up and you were playing for the, for you know for your local team or whoever, and, and it was a big fucking thing, you know, your family's all come and watched, and and you're on the big circuit, you're 15, and the fucking coach, you know, or the manager pulls you off at half time or whatnot, you're absolutely pissed off, and and, and you, you whether you've been frustrated with yourself or you're frustrated with with being pulled off, I used to get the shits big time. Fucking cunt pulling me off. I fucking you know shove your fucking fucking fuck fuck fuck. So I don't know if Urzel was like that, but everyone's been there and done it. Just because these guys are, are professionals, they still get a bit you know a bit pissed off when they get taken off as well. Jonas eighty two. Um, I heard heard the question on Ask Blog. Here we go, Schwinn. This one for you. For which I apologise, but I thought it was well interesting and wanted to hear your thoughts. Are we paying the price for putting out such strong teams in all cup games? No, we. we you guys spoke about this a bit earlier, uh, and I, 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 I empathise with that to an extent. I think maybe that is a bit too much read into concerning the result, but. You know, we've just come off an international break, so the players have been fresh, considering a lot of them did not make the travels uh, with their international teams. And seemingly, this was not the issue a few weeks ago when, you know, when we were playing the other rounds of the Europa League and the EFL Cup. Now, I know fatigue sort of, you know, carries on and, and it compounds over time. But, you know, we were not far away from from securing a result yesterday. I think the only difference yesterday was that we were not able to maintain control in the second half because our first halves have been poor in general. So comparing yesterday to the rest of the games, I think fatigue was an issue, maybe just not as much as it's made out to be. Okay. Um, here comes Hack on Larson. I haven't seen him for a little bit. Should Atkinson let the game go, go on instead of giving the penalty to Zaha, Tony? 
Um, and he goes on. Grenit sticks out his leg, but Zaha jumps with both feet right after he touches the ball and into Grenit. Atkinson is well-placed, decided before it happened, in my opinion. I've seen it so many times on so many different angles. I can only really answer this question with what I saw at the ground. The moment it happened, every single person said penalty. And you'll get people that come out in hindsight and now they've seen the replays that were there and saying, oh, I knew he dived. The fact is they didn't. There was not a single person in the Arsenal end who had any complaints about it at all. Um, so for me, it, look, most people don't think it was. I, I obviously do. But whether you think it was or you wasn't, I don't think you can blame the ref. Mm, interesting. Okay. Because as, as Schwinn said, Schwinn also doesn't think it's a penalty. So he's got the opposite view to me. But on first view in, as he said, he thought absolute penalty. So, and that's all the ref had. The ref doesn't have all these angles. And for me, it looked, it didn't only just look like, oh, it might be a penalty. It looked completely stonewalled. There is absolutely no decision. This is definitely a penalty. And that's pretty much what Schwinn said when he was talking about it earlier. And that's all the ref has to go on. Was that, was that your uh, first sensation as well, Tez? No. I thought no. What on no, first no. viewing, you thought it was a dive? My my first my first thought, I thought he I thought he was ripped off. I thought no. I think you're the only person I've heard say that. You got it right, mate. That's all I'll say. I just I just thought it was ripped off straight away. I thought he's fucking dived there. And I, I haven't was watched any amazing? I haven't watched any highlights. I watched the game at six o'clock this morning, and that was it. I, I that was my my first my first thoughts was. And I think, didn't I even say it in the WhatsApp group with you boys? Um, but I thought, it, I just, no, I didn't actually. Um, I, was that based on Zaha's reputation maybe to an extent? Or was that solely based on what your eyes saw there? Just, just what I saw, mate. Yeah, I mean, just what I saw. That, that's obviously not what me and Tony felt, but, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's what you perceive at that point. And, I mean, the fact is that he made a meal out of it. So the fact that you recognize it, I think, is 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 kudos to you, I guess. Mustafi well, one, I thought. Say, I thought it was Mustafi one. But oh, also yeah, to I say that it. in this question, Hakon said I've seen it nine or ten times, and I don't think it was. But that anything past time one doesn't matter because that's all the ref gets. So, yeah, but the problem you've got to get, and this no, is why... So, sorry, so, if right, he, yeah. it was so clear, yeah. you don't need to watch it another eight times. So no, he obviously, no. and again, I'm not criticising Hakon, I'm, ju- I'm just putting my point out there, that if he thought it was so clear, you don't need to watch it nine or ten times. You watch it one time and go, wasn't a penalty. And then you, you might watch it to confirm in different angles and whatnot. But the fact that he's had to look for that many angles, the ref doesn't have that, that privilege. So mm. when you're thinking what the ref's done, you have to go on what you saw first time. And as I said, for me... For everyone in the stands and for Schwinn, we all said penalty. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, look, I don't watch. It is what it is at the end of the day. Look, it was awarded a penalty. I felt it was a bit harsh. I seen it as I saw it and thought no penalty. It was given. Um, it's no point me sitting back watching fucking replays or highlights because at the end of the day, it's still given a penalty, so... Doesn't really matter what I say or what I feel or what I think. So. Yeah, no, I was just saying that. Sorry, into response to the question, saying should Atkinson have waited? But I think if he waited another two or three seconds, he still would have given a penalty because he, don't, he wouldn't have seen it anymore. No, no. So what I was saying wasn't in response to you saying you don't think it was. It was in response to the question saying I've seen it nine, ten times. But as I said, anything after the first time in terms of actual giving the decision doesn't matter. Yeah, you're lucky then, Cam. <laughs> <laughs> no, all good. Okay. Um, heck on Larson. Uh, he's gone on a bit of a rant here, so we'll just roll with this and see if you boys jump in. Then jump in, Schwinn, if you feel the need here. I also think we missed Granite in the middle today. No offence, Gwenduzi, but Tuera and Granite work very well together. Bellerin and Monreal are also crucial to the game. We play with big loss with it. We're a big loss without them. It wasn't our day. Looked tired and we played bad. Uh, how will the players react? 
I think there's there, there should be cause for concern in a couple of departments. But I also think that, you know, let's not forget, you know, as, as people have been pointing out to most of those who are criticizing yesterday, that we have won 11 games on the trot, which I don't think has happened in, what, 10 years or more. So, you know, and, and, and to add to that, we did get a point. You know, we probably should have gotten all three. But I don't think many people will argue that we didn't deserve any on the day. You know, I think Palace... From, from the onset were in the driver's seat and uh, and barring those 10 minutes in the second half, 10, 15 minutes, whatever it was, they, they deserve to get the result. If anything, you know, they did feel hard done by uh, in terms of how things panned out at the very end. So I think there there is cause for concern in certain departments. And I think players will take some solace from the fact that they've started the season well. You know, after the Chelsea game, if you had said that we we're going to get, what, 22 points out of 24 I think all of us would have would have taken that at that very point and just snatched your hand from it. So th- there there is a lot of reason to be positive. There's a, there are certain departments that need to be fixed, and I think knowing Emery from what little we've seen from him so far, I think there is confidence in 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 him from from the fan base. So I, I, I'm optimistic. You know, these things will happen. We will lose points. We will drop points, and and in in circumstances that cannot be avoided, and that's exactly what happened yesterday uh, at the very end. So. Keep calm and carry on. Um, he goes on and says, Ozil never, ever, had should never have ever been taken off. Absolutely wrong by Emery in his opinion. Why did you think he did it? Uh, we needed fresh legs in the middle. So we have already covered that. We've pretty much all agreed to it as well. Um, this was, hack on goes on, this was a game Welbeck should have started in his opinion. But when he didn't, I think Emery did the wrong sub. Lacquer should have been taken off for Welbeck. Abemiang should should then have played as our striker and Welbeck on the left wing to help Shaka. So, it's not a bad thought. Yeah, I mean, I, I probably wouldn't have started Danny again. He played 90 uh, in midweek. Um, or if he didn't play 90, he played a good 85. Um, and it's difficult because I think the the problem side is the left in terms of protecting Granite and if you play Danny there then I don't think Aubameyang particularly works on the right I think that right is a huge issue and it's what worries me most about going forward to the Liverpool game as well because I don't know who should play there we've got no one that fits the job you, you play Ozil there it's obvious he's not perfect there Mkhitaryan it's awful defensively and offensively doesn't impact the game as often as I would like. Iwobi's never been anywhere near as good on the right as he is on the left. And and Welbeck, you get work rate and industry, but then you lose any form of control of the football. So I think that right is a huge issue for us. We just have no one that in an ideal world can play there. So even if you do bring Danny in yesterday, I still think it, it everything's still a mess and you, you basically, we have to play players out of position. We have no option but to play players out of position. Even Ramsey coming on the sub yesterday on the right, that's a joke in itself. We found out eight years ago Ramsey couldn't play there. Mm. I don't know why it's a thing again. <laughs> nice. Um, okay, Vichy come with us. Uh, Vichy's got another question. Uh, personally, the Arsenal away supporters were phenomenal yesterday. How do you create an atmosphere similar to Anfield, where the fans are the twelfth man creating a yep absolute myth. Anfield fans are shit. Okay. Next question. <laughs> Wait, is it, isn't the game at the Emirates anyway? Yeah, it is. I think he's just saying why can't our home fans be like the Liverpool? And he's used Liverpool ah. because it's always perceived in the media that they have a brilliant home support. They don't. They play, and you'll never walk a, alone over a tannoy very, very loudly. You can't even hear the fans sing. Like for me, if you're that good, turn the music off and let them sing. They're they're good on well, they look good on TV on European nights. Obviously, I've never been there on a European night, but I don't know again how much that is the media playing their part and making this Liverpool fan base look amazing because they certainly ain't in the league. And I've been there. I've been there on weekends. I've been there for midweek games. I've been there in the summer. I've been there in the winter. It's always been shit. <laughs> I'll take a word for it, mate. Um, nothing's as good as this, though. Oh, 
fucking what a goal this. Shame we didn't win that game. Um, okay. Shree, uh, what did you make of... Fucking... Of who? Sen... Sen... Sen Lee? Sen Lee, yeah, yeah. In, the, in an interview, especially the parts about the players cannot run down contracts and murder Sacker is now part of the executive committee. Um, okay. You boys enlighten me. Someone enlighten me there. I'm, I've missed that story. Yeah, I think Amy Lawrence is the one who did a piece in The Guardian uh, where, where she spoke about uh, San Leahy and, and Venkatesham. And and how things have been changed ever since this this new hierarchy has been put in place. I think there's there's a couple of reasons why Arsenal fans are not quite happy because it seems KSC have underlined the point that they will not be making any additional investments and we will continue to you know operate on the model of a self sustaining club. Now, I, you know, let's be honest. Even if KSC were to make an investment into the club for for recruiting, they're not going to come out and say that. So. Not that I believe that there will be a substantial investment from KIC. I also don't want to just necessarily discard it because they do now have 100% ownership and they have a you know a higher interest in, in making sure that Arsenal becomes even more successful and doesn't doesn't flatline or, or worse decline. So I wouldn't necessarily you know pay too much attention to that. But yeah, there, there were some other interesting comments that were made. You know, it, it seems there is an enhanced level of communication between the ownership and, and the operating officers. There seems to be a WhatsApp group, which seems to be the theme of uh, of social media interaction these days, where there is a twenty four seven sort of communication line open between the the top brass at Arsenal. So uh, it seems people in the U.S. are watching games. They they are very much up to date with what's happening behind the scenes. And, and, you know, that's the way we would like it. And that's the way you would expect it when you have a higher interest in, you know, in the club. As for Murdisacker, I'm not quite sure what is being mentioned here. Uh, I do know that Rafi Honigstein uh, did confirm to me when I was having a, uh, an interaction with him a few months ago that he is not the manager of the, the academy. Rather, he is managing the academy in the sense of an administrative job. So where people thought that he will be doing the coaching, uh, that is not true. He will be higher up in the hierarchy and he'll be looking at many more facets of, of how the academy is run. So, you know, Murdisacker is obviously one player who has, you know, endeared himself to to Arsenal over, over the years. And he's, he's a very intelligent person from all accounts. So he's, he's in a good position to to nurture talent. He has the right mentality to nurture talent. And I think we will rely a bit more heavily on on some of the youth players from from here on out, which which has not quite been the case in the last three four years. Which is good to hear. You know, you want some competition coming down from the ranks. So I, I think all in all, there's reason to be positive. I'm not quite surprised one way or the other the way things have gone. You know, anyone who read the article I put out a few months ago sort of hinted towards these moves and escalated responsibility and escalated communication channel, and that seems to be the go. So. I am. I, I'm still as optimistic as I was a few months ago. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Um, the shaft for our performance. I'm just going to skim through these questions, guys, because a lot of them are like really touching on stuff we've already spoken about. So, look, I do appreciate everybody's questions, but they're um, overlapping what we've already discussed. Um. We'll go to Jake. Now, the reason I would say we'll go to Jake is because he he done our ratings this week for us at the Clock End Talk blog, which I will pull up soon. Boys, have you lads seen that? Uh, I read the ratings this morning. Yeah. What do you think? Me too. What do you think? Um, yeah, they. I've obviously previously um, called out Craig's ratings on the game. I can't remember what it was. Um, I didn't look at it this and think anything's wrong. As I said, I remember that one week where I can't even remember what game it was where I thought Craig got quite a lot wrong and it stood out. I looked at it and I thought, what is he talking about? <laughs> Whereas this one, I read it and everything was like, oh, fair enough. If I disagreed, it might be by half a point, but then nothing really stand out. I, yeah, I think yeah. it's a difficult game to give anyone a high score yesterday, really. Well, the only thing I singled him out for is um, he didn't give Granite the man of the match. I'll let you. Fucking miserable. <laughs> he gave it to Herrera as well, didn't he? 
Yeah, you give it the two or But look, it, it's hard, hard to split them, to be honest. No, it's not, it's not hard to split them at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, clockandtalk.blogspot.com is where you can find that and Jake's ratings, and we've tweeted it out, and it's on Facebook and everywhere. So he's got a question. Uh, my question, Zaha, was it a... Oh. <laughs> Same fucking stuff we're going over. Uh, my question, Zaha, was it a dive? And is it that sort of time where we should look look at it and say, hey, that's just a good opportunity to go down, or should we slander that sort of play? Mm, it is interesting, I suppose. Um, Tony, you don't think it was a dive, if it was a penalty? I think- oh, I think he's made the absolute most of contact, but that seemed, that's what happens now. I, I, look, I agree it should be a dive, but looking in the context of modern football, that happens every week in the Premier League. And we're, we're questioning it heavily because it was against us. But as I said, it's similar. When Lacazette could have gone down against Watford and didn't and stayed on his feet and we didn't get the penalty, we was all moaning he should have gone down. But had he gone down, it would have been exactly the same as what Zaha done yesterday. So when our player done the opposite, we was all saying, oh, he done the wrong thing, he should have dived. So, I, I agree Zaha went down too easy, but as I said, I just think in modern football, that's what happens. That's just what and, they do. Yeah, and it gets given, so you can't blame them. As I said, it's not the attacker's job to to stay on their feet. And and modern days, if, if the player gives them an opportunity to go down, they're going to take it. Yep, very true. Uh, MAA Gunner, do you think Wenger would be successful at Real Madrid? <laughs> them poor cunts would need the fucking Pope to help them out. Um, he has world class class players at every position yet. Yeah, where's the world class players? Um, he'll have the money to strengthen. Well, apparently, if they had the money, yeah, they might have some money, but they're fucking not going to spend it. So they haven't spent that Ronaldo money yet, have they? Um, I don't know, boys. Would you like to see Wenger at Real Madrid? Schwinn? No. Tony? Not for me. Not mid-season. No, no I wouldn't either. Um, MAA Gunner, should we buy more than one left back? Fucking buy six of the cunts. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, and I, look I, as I have to agree with what Tony said I would love to buy another left back but then after what Tony type of pointed out and said well you can't really have three left backs you know main left backs can you because what's the other third bloke going to do when they're all fit the only counter argument I did have though Tony and I type of knew this question was popping up um is Monreal got a season to go and do we look at bringing somebody in to replace him? Well, yeah, I mean, that's obviously a bit different if you're looking to replace one or both of the current fullbacks than, than having more. Um, Monreal, they're in talks to extend his contract. Uh, I assume that will happen because Arsenal spoke about it publicly and they tend to not speak about it unless they know that it's agreed. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't rate Kolasinac, I never have done. So I'd probably get rid of him and, and maybe bring in someone else. And even if that's bringing a, a first choice left back and, and relegate Monreal to second choice and make him fight for his place, because obviously he is getting on a bit, then yeah, that would be something I'd be in favour on. I'd be very surprised if they get rid of, if they sign two and then obviously get rid of two. Would um, that be something you'd be open for in January? Uh I'm not a big advocate of a first team change in, in, in mid season unless it's a star name. I think I've said this before on here. That I don't think a left back and even even who'd you get realistically on Arsenal's budget that's gonna be better than Monreal? And then you also have to get Kalasanas' wages off the book, which are extraordinarily high. My, eye, my, eyes are wide, yeah, my eyes are wide open now since Gwen Doozy signed. I, I you just don't know who's Fenn's got his eye on these days. Yeah, but I mean, to bring that person into the first team ahead of Nacho in January is it's a tough ask. Mm. There, 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 there is these players out there, but I think you've got to look at Gwendausi as the exception to the rule rather than it can be done in every position every week. Mm. Um, 
Yeah, fucking claws and that. Jesus, he's playing a bit of a. Fight. I know where you're Sven actually did. But... Sven actually did try and sign a, a left back on deadline day, but it didn't get work from it. Who was it? Uh, someone from French League Two, or maybe League One. I don't know. No, okay, so it could be a January sign. So I think he went somewhere else because he couldn't get a permit because obviously our window closed before everyone else's. Uh, I can't okay. remember. Bendel maybe. I think Schwinn might remember. He's got. He remembers that useless shit. <laughs> Swin silence is definitely. Yeah, there he is. No, I, I mean I've heard the name Wendell, but I I think he plays in Germany, doesn't he? Or does he play in Netherlands? I don't think he plays in France. No, there was a guy who played in France. Met, I think it was like Mendel, like Mendy with an L on the end. Um, he mm. and he was either I'm pretty sure he's in the French second division, and we was in talks to sign him, but then I, maybe he's Algerian or something, and he couldn't get a work permit. I mean, there's there's Hamza Mendel. Uh, who now plays for Schalke, and I think he used to play for what Nice was it uh, before like, he left? Maybe it was him. I'm so, sure that whoever it was uh, couldn't get a work permit, and then they ended up getting a move, and it might have been to Germany. So it could be him. Yeah, because I think we we were linked with a, a left back uh, at the very end, and I think even Furlan Mendy. Oh, Furlan Mendy is the one I think who plays for Nice. Uh, Hamza Mendel played for Lille. Um, so that that would make sense because he did move to Schalke. I don't think Furlan Mendy moved though. So I mean, look, there, there's a lot of talent out there, and when you have someone like Sven, I, I wouldn't necessarily count out a, a youth prospect being signed or a youth prospect who's very much on, you know, who's about to be ready to start for uh, for a club like Arsenal. But to expect us to go out in January and get the likes of you know someone equivalent to a David Alaba or or someone who can really put a shift in is absolutely moronic, and it's it's not feasible financially. So no way that happens. Yeah, I don't give a fuck who it is, as long as he can play fucking left back. Here, here. You know, I was shit myself when I was thinking Welbeck was going to jump in left back. Whatever happened to that? No, shit, it was nonsense. Just a load of shit, wasn't it? Just to jill us up. He played uh, one training session there, but it happened to be an open training session. Yeah. So, obviously, the media saw that and thought, oh, well, he has been playing left back. But he wasn't. Has anyone noticed? Here's Chambers going online. Well, they've got the worst defence in the league. So, I don't think he's not been playing every week, I don't think. Yeah, but I know uh, they're the worst. But is it is it not because of him, though, is it? Well, sure. They're just so open. I mean, I know he didn't play against us, but just they're just so open. They're so easy to score against because they let you play. Oh, and I don't think by this week, they? Yeah, awesome, um, they, they, they're just getting dicked every. I think they're conceding an average of like two point eight a game, which is ridiculous. Mm. Not doing okay. Um, because the next question, M W A Gunner, should we recall Nelson? No, because he's getting minutes. Yeah. For me, um, I'm not sure. There's r- rumours that we can recall him in January. I'm not 100 percent sure if they're true. I don't know. Um, but he's playing games there. So unless you're going to bring him in to start, not for me. Leave him there. Yeah. What would we recall him for, though? What would well, we I can play on the right. We actually don't. As I said, when I was going through our options on the right earlier, we don't actually have anyone who can naturally play on the right. Yeah. Nelson Camp. That's, yeah. that's, that's, that's the, yeah. Okay. Defence, with all due respect to me, who's a legend... Uh, <laughs> uh, with all due, res- due credit to some wonderful second half performances and El Nenny's substitutes, we got found out today. The symptoms were always there, poor transition, no pace on the wings. Emery let down by poor finishing. Uh, short-term outcomes have been masking systems, sy- sy- systematic. System, ah, uh, fuck yeah, right, uh, issues. Defense system, yeah. Um, Cosman Butta, the the Urzel problem is it him or is it the system? It's Urzel. Um, I don't go think fuck yourself. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. It's guys okay, win. Uh, well, firstly, congratulations to Cosman Butta, who I think just. Got married this last week, so how do you from know all this of us. about people? Well, it's oh, yeah, on his I, Twitter. I, I, I congratulate him too. Don't you, you follow? Yeah, he, don't you follow our fucking listeners, Tony? 
Aí eu não falo que não, mano. <laughs> Interaction, my friend. Can you hear anything I follow as a sat nav? And I don't listen to that much. <laughs> Yeah, we're in WhatsApp, we're fucking socialising with them, mate. We're fucking all over this shit. I mean, congratulations. It wasn't a criticism at his wedding. I just don't know how <laughs> things. So, yeah, well done. I hope him and Mrs. Booter are very happy. They certainly look very happy from whatever pictures he put on, so congratulations are in order for sure. And um, having said that, I don't think it was either. It's not, you know, it's not him. It's not the system. It's just a bad day at the office. You know, we, we, we saw last week what he's capable of. We obviously are well aware that it will take Emery to, you know, it will take him time to necessarily figure out what sort of a squad to deploy against the opposition. Uh, this is not to say he doesn't know the opposition, but he is getting to know how relentless the English league can get. And it's only going to get worse from here on out till, till the end of January, pretty much. So, you know, it, it, it's it's a transition, as as defense said earlier, and it will take time. And Mesodozil is a big piece of the puzzle, and many would say he's a crucial piece of the puzzle. So, you know, just give it time. These things will happen. We will drop points. Um, and Palace, if anything, was a London derby and, you know, maybe a respectable place to drop points if you want to see it that way. So I'm not too worried. Okay. So it's right about now, if Bundaberg Rum were listening, I could be fucking sponsored, but we could be sponsored by Bundaberg Rum and I could be sending old mate a fucking free bottle of Bundaberg Rum for a congratulations of his wedding. Shit's all over that wine, Schwind. It's really bad, don't even. <laughs> Which reminds me, have you sent that Soul Camel poster yet, Tez? Oh, I've done that fucking months ago. No, you haven't? <laughs> yes, yeah, so I sent it to... Um, that RC fellow, wasn't it? No. Yeah. Was it in Pete? Oh, Pete, Pete. It was Pete. Yeah, he, Did you yeah. send it to the wrong guy? No, no, I sent it to Pete. <laughs> he hasn't asked the question here for a long time, so he's probably got the shits of me, old Pete. No, he's actually, um, he messaged me back. He's going to, he didn't want it for Christmas because he's going to give it to his dad for Christmas and get it framed up, so. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Um, Cosman Butter. Uh, will we get the chance to meet the guys behind the pod? Maybe a live stream pod or something like that. He obviously hasn't seen what we look like. <laughs> There's a reason why we're behind the mic, my friend. <laughs> Faces for the radio. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> swim singing. No, fuck off. I want to go live. <laughs> yeah, swim, swim fancy himself a bit of ten. Yeah, mate, we, we fucking know where, where our place is. <laughs> um, PMC Schwinn's got no comment on that, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing at all. <laughs> Just silence. <laughs> it's because I'm eating dim sums. <laughs> uh, thought you were putting your makeup on ready for camera. Getting a selfie stick out. <laughs> Oh, fucking hell. Um, who should be uh, two centre-halves when Socrates and uh, Kashani are fully fit, Tony? Uh, it really depends on what, um, how Kashani comes back and, and what we see. I mean, in our head and romantically, we think of the very best Kashani. I don't think we're ever going to see that again. And I think if we do, because I can only answer that question hypothetically, if we get back the best Kashani... For me, the two that are out, it being Socrates and Kashani, would be our best pairing. But we never know. I mean, for me, uh, Socrates at the moment, we, even like with Kashani out, Socrates would be my first choice. But obviously, he can't get back in the team. So there, they, Emery obviously sees something different, or he's not quite fit. We don't know. Um, the more interesting is who he goes with the other one, because I think Holding's been pretty good in every game. Um, we haven't kept the clean sheet in the league without holding in the team I don't think not off the top of my head so I mean I know a lot of people would think drop him he's young and the, the least experienced but I think he's been good in pretty much every game then Mustafi always has he's in general he's been quite good but he has these moments and we we're not even surprised when he does dickhead things anymore it's just you're just waiting for it to happen you just know it's going to happen yeah yeah, I mean, this time we've been waiting quite a while, which is welcome, but you never know. He's, 
you just you just don't know what you're going to get with him. Mm. So uh, it's difficult. I would I'd probably go Socrates and Holding at the moment. But then, as I said, you never know because I think the best Mustafi is better than Holding. But you're just you just know that something's going to go wrong. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm like, really who would you start yet. next week? Oh. It's fucking tough. Um, I would like, I'd maybe holding holding Socrates. I, I, I don't know the right answer to that question. <laughs> like, mm. Swim, put down your dim sum. Who would you start against Liverpool? I would start Mustafi and Socrates. Or you'd say that. Mm. I, I just don't think Socrates is very much suited to the right centre back role. And with holding, holding in the picture, um, that's the only place that that Socrates will be deployed. I think. I think he's you know, more suited there. I think he only played on the left because Mustafi can't play anywhere else. I think that has been the case while he was at Dortmund, but I think the English pace is a bit more, um, you know, suited to him on the left end. I mean, don't get me wrong; he's shown his uh, his speed a few times, and I've been very surprised by it. But I think with Mustafi ahead of him, he is, you know, he's the brains of the defense. And he's able to orchestrate the people around him and and make decisions as to when he should charge out and when he should just mop up. I think he, him conducting defense is better than him being the aggressor, and that leaves holding as the only one. And I'm not, I don't quite fancy our chances with that setup. I uh, don't, I don't like Mustafi because the problem is, is we're going to have, and as you just said, Tony, we're going to be, let's say hypothetically, we're at one all going into the 60th minute. I know this is fucking hypothetical. Mustafi's that player that'll fuck it all up and you fucking lose the game 2-1 or something. And that's just the type of risk that Mustafi gives you where I don't like that risk. I like a sure thing. That's why I don't want Mustafi. Uh, I I think it's one. It's just opinions, to be honest. I, I don't... I don't think there's any answer where everyone would go, yeah, that's mine. I think everyone will have a different opinion. I, I knew what Shrim would say, and I can't particularly argue with it. It's not what I would do. But I, I actually think that's what Emery will do. I actually I think Schwinn says what Emery will do, to be honest. Mm, Schwinn reads his book. <laughs> Jeff R., welcome to the podcast, brother. You have about six questions, and I see you there. Okay, oh, wow. let's go. Let's rock and roll. You ready to strap in, boys? Actually, there's about eight questions, I'll tell a lie. Okay, um, we have played three games in nine days. I could tell Six. that. Hey? Six days. No. Well, listen, Jeff R's asking the fucking question, not you. <laughs> yeah, but he's got to ask it correct. <laughs> I was like, oh, we went, we went invincible last season. Yeah, was, I'm asking the question so I can say that. I actually looked and thought, fuck, did I say six or nine? <laughs> I thought it was me fucked it up. So, no, nah, it's all good. It's nine days, he says. We played three games in nine days. Six. <laughs> <laughs> can I get the fucking question out? <laughs> um, I could tell that just by looking at a Wobie and Lacazette's run, does Emery need to rotate the team better with the games that are coming up? I think if we played three games in nine days, they probably wouldn't need too much rotation. But as it's six, yeah, we should probably rotate. Okay, our back line is just shocking to me. Do we need to focus on bringing in full backs and centre backs in January? Sweet. Anyone? Pretty much covered that, didn't we? Yep, right. Okay, number three. With us being at the top of the Europa League table, should Emery start bringing in some under-23 players in integrating them into the first team to get used to so that when we have injuries, we can have avoid playing the games out of normal positions, uh, playing players out of normal positions. Uh, Schwinn? I don't think that's the right thing to do. Uh, I think people at times forget what the, the golfing class is between a first team player, whether they are a starter, squad member, or, or reserve player with you know, with an under 23 player, there's, there's a massive jump involved there. And, you know, people who need to be integrated as uh, the word that Jeff used are good enough to do that. And those come at a premium. There are not many of those who can do that. You know, we haven't seen that at the left back position. I think Dominic Thompson was included in some of the training sessions recently, but obviously he hasn't made the cut. 
And, you know, again, Zach Medley was another one who was on the bench the other day. But again, you know, I don't think he's anywhere near the squad right now. Just to throw these players out there because we fear an injury is 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 a disservice almost to the, some of these players because it can really, you know, take a shot at their confidence. Every now and then rotation has to be, you know, a bit more. And I agree with that. But just to pick out under 23 players and, and blood them in these games, despite having secured you know, the top berth, I think, would be a catastrophic move. And I bet you, Tony, you don't want some fucking dim in there. Uh, I'm, I'm not a huge fan. I'm fucking swimming his dim fins. <laughs> <laughs> um, number four, with Martial running down his contract, should we bring him in in January and go to a 4-4-2 system that fans have been crying out for? Or should we focus on bringing in the quality commanding centre back and two full backs to solidify our shaky defence and to add depth in defence? Tony? I don't think we can go 4 4 2. I don't think we have the the wingers for it. And I know you're saying, oh, if you bring Marshall in, I still don't see who plays on the right. Then if you want to have Ozil in the team, you literally Torreira out on his own with, with three attacking players, well, five attacking players ahead of him. And, and four behind him it's just I, I don't think we've got the players to play it and I think you'd struggle to play it in modern football anyway when everyone plays a three in midfield we saw yesterday when we changed to 4-4-2 the three versus their three versus our two we were massively outnumbered and outplayed and we couldn't get our foot on the ball Max Mayer looked fucking incredible when he came on because he was a spare man um, so I, I can't see us going 4-4-2 I know Schwinn says this all the time but I think our problem runs deeper than the players I don't think we can answer or solve every problem just with transfers. And that seems like what everyone wants to do at the moment. Just say, oh, if we get him, if we get that. But our defensive systems are not right. Like, you can blame Mustafi or Xhaka or whoever you want for for the second penalty yesterday. But the fact is we're 2-1 up with nine minutes to go and we had six players ahead of the ball. Or six players within 30 yards of their goal. I don't care who you've got at centre-back. The system is wrong. It's better than it was last year because I spent most of last season saying the system was the problem. And I, I genuinely think it's better, but it's still not right. So, And until you get that right, the players are, are only going to make a minor difference. Mm. Yeah, you always hear us linked to this and linked to that, and you think, is the fucking grass always greener on the other side? I'm just, I was just thinking as you are talking, Martial, what's he going to bring into a left, left-wing position? Because we're playing The thing is, no, I mean, look, he would be an improvement he'd be an improvement on any of our left wingers, but we'd still have the same issue that if you're going to try and shoehorn Lacazette and Aubameyang into the same team, Aubameyang is going to play on the left. If you bring Martial in, then you're now shoehorning maybe Aubameyang onto the right. Yeah. Which that's, that's doesn't cool. work. Or if you're going two up top, as I said, you end up with Martial, the two strikers, Ozil, and then whoever you're playing on the right. And it's just like, then you're just basically probably saying, we're going to score more goals. You know, this game will be five, four. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, I like a balance too. Yep. Um, number five. If we're still within three to six points of the top of the table by the end of December, should Emery go back to the drawing board and assess whether Europa League is worth playing our starting 11 players based on quality teams that will drop from the Champions League? Schwinn? Uh, by the end of December, uh, I think that's that's where the fault lies within not not the question, but the, the thought process there, because you know we won't resume European duties till till February, so we have time till then to assess. And I would go as far as to say that if we are still in the top four, three to six points from the top of the table would imply that you know it's it, it, we're closer to the top than than we are then to you know dropping down into the fifth or sixth position and i at that point i would much rather put our eggs in the in the premier league basket because the way things are going in europe right now it seems some top teams and you know maybe even paris saint germain will will fall into the europa league and i would rather have you know take chances in in the premier league than than play those teams in, in europe with the likes of neymar running down at hector fucking bellerin and mbappe at at granite Chaco or nacho Montreal. So I, I think 
three to six points, February, go for the league. Try to see what what fixtures are sandwiched between other fixtures and and maybe take a gamble here or there if you think you have a chance of progressing in the tournament without taking a lot of uh, heat for the weekend. But I, I take my chances in England. Okay, and Jeff, uh, we I've see the other question there, mate. We've already t- covered it, so thank you for your questions, brother. Uh, Dean Potter, we conceded sixteen shots on target against Palace, and currently have had more shots against us so far this season than Cardiff and Huddersfield. Sooner or later, this was going to catch up with us. How do you feel knowing the Liverpool game comes up next in the league, Tony? Just That surely can't be right. There's no way they had oh, 16 no, shots. I'm going to check it out after this podcast because I thought exactly the same. Um, if, I, I mean, I can't remember Leno making a save. Not, this is not criticising Leno. I can't remember him making a save. So... If they had 16 shots on target, they scored 16 goals. Um, okay. Well, well, let's have let's go on another question while I look that up. Um, they had 16 shots and three were on target. And yeah, and two of them went in. So there you go. Look, conceding shots is a is a horrible stat because how many of them shots that they missed were were bad ch- chances that we gave gave up? It's conceding shots isn't an issue if they're not dangerous. Because anyone can shoot from anywhere. In reality, we did concede too many chances. Zaha hit the post. Townsend missed a sitter just after. Um, it is a concern that we're leaking chances. I think we'd looked a lot more solid in the last few games with Xhaka and Torreira in the middle, and we clearly missed that yesterday, both offensively and defensively. Um, but, yeah, it is a concern. I don't know how they do anything about that. What was the other shot? On my... What was the other shot, sure. We close I'm the pulling it up over. now. No, I have it. It's seven shots and two on target. Okay. Seven. Mm. I mean, for, again, just to qualify the, this a bit more, and we won't get into this too much because obviously there's opposing views on this, but if you look at XG stats, Arsenal were negative 0.3 and Crystal Palace were 1.15. So although the score was 2-2, the XG also shows you, you know, quite a golfing class there. So, you know, just to qualify this a bit more, we don't have to go into it anymore. Uh, the XG doesn't include penalties, does it? Uh, I'm not sure what this model does, the one I'm looking at. I would imagine it does not. I'm pretty sure it doesn't. So if they're saying 1.5 plus two penalties. And then also, what? how did you get negative? Let's just think of the side. Well, it's, it's, a compound, it's a compound of... When your positive XG with you squandering chances, I would imagine. So the offensive value added, plus the passing value added, plus the on-ball value added, plus shots location. And in, in this case, the offensive value added is negative, and the on-ball value added is also negative. So the, 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 the sum total is a negative. Without boring people too much, me and Schwinn always disagree about XG. He rates it, I think it's useless. For me, like... You can't get, you can't score less than zero. So, the fact that the model even has a negative aspect to it just makes no sense to me. <laughs> let me let me look closer no here. You start with nil. Like, <laughs> yeah, you do. You're right. No. Look, okay. listen. Yeah, I'm, sure I'm looking at the right. sorting out his fucking stats here. Um, let's push through these questions because we've been rolling for two hours now. Um, King Lee, that's his name that I call him on this fucking show. Um, this is the second question for the week. Uh, how many new bodies do we need? Positions and who would who would depart? Tony. Uh, again, what I said about five minutes ago. I don't think you can solve everything with with just new people. I think we're crying out for a right winger. Um, the, the, there's the names Dembele and Malcolm are always going to be about, but. We just need anyone that can actually play there. People keep going on about Granite playing on the left because it gives us balance at left back. But what about on the right wing? We've got absolutely no balance there. So I think for me, that's one of the main ones. I I think we probably need a better centre-back than any of the ones we've got, but that's not going to happen because it costs big money. Um, In terms of, I don't think we particularly need another centre-back just in terms of getting another one, but we need an increase in quality there. But, I don't think that's going to happen. 
And it depends what your your goal are. What do we need to win the Champions League? Probably eight new players, in all honesty. What do you need to get top four? I, I don't think we're a million miles off. Mm. So it yeah. all depends. This question is will be a different answer depending on what your end goal is. Yeah. Um, Siddhartha, thank you for your question. He's just saying uh, that Merzel, uh, uh, it wasn't Merzel is shit. Um, Schwinn can get fucked. So thanks for that. No, no he's not. Well. Um, <laughs> he, won't, he won't say that. <laughs> no, he says um, it wasn't Ozil's greatest match. That I would agree with. But what manager who tries to win the game with control removes team's uh, best creative player? Is this one of your mates, Schwinn? Uh, well, I mean, I don't know him personally, but just because he thinks like me doesn't mean he's, he's a friend of mine. But I mean, one of Schwinn Burner's account. <laughs> I, really, I was going to no, say I actually, that. I actually agree. To be fair, yeah, nah. I'm taking the piss out of Schwinn. <laughs> I mean, if, if if it were up to you guys, I'd have 17 burner accounts uh, and I think 15 different phone numbers. I'm looking through these fucking question thread, and I'm wondering how many of these questions come from your, one of your burner accounts. <laughs> Um, and Darren, just, just to clear up, hang on. Let me say this last question. Darren says no depth of outside backs, and what's up with Nacho? Or oh, what's up with Nacho? Nothing. We don't know, do we? I don't know. He's still he being must, monitored. He must be coming best. back because Emery did say that. Um, granted, he's better in the middle, so I wonder if that's a hint that he's coming back this week. They were. I think him and Kalasinac were both hamstring, I believe. But then they just keep saying they're being monitored. There's no date on either of them. And the thing is with hamstrings, they can range from a week to about three months. So it depends on what grade of hamstring it is, which hasn't been released. Um, so you never know. It'll be interesting to see who plays there on Wednesday. As much as I'm expecting a, a reserve team or a, a heavily rotated team, it's going to be interesting because if Hector's out, of next Saturday then you're going to say Lichsteiner shouldn't be playing on Wednesday just in case and then the left back we've got the same issue we ain't got a fucking clue who's going to play there so it'll be interesting to see what happens then mm-hmm. you know Schwinn you got your stats sorted out bro yeah so I was looking at the wrong graph uh, it seems the XG was 0.95 versus 2.33 who in what, what 0.9 to them 0.95 for us and 2.33 for them. Even, so is that including penalties or not? No. But then I'm trying to think of other chances. They only had the one other shot on target. I can't even remember it. Well, I mean, it, it's going to look at option. It, it's going to look at that Meyer chance, for example, that came late in the half, right? Late in the second half, which was, again, a very acute angle, but it was very close to the wasn't, goal. Wasn't there about three or four chances I had in the first half, first 20 minutes or something? Well, Zaha hit the post and then Townsend missed an absolute sitter after. I don't think they had anything else. Yeah, so uh, the, the model that I'm looking at, which is by Scott Willis, who is at an O underscore that underscore crap. Sorry about that. Uh, says that they had two big chances, uh, five in the day, and uh, they were in the danger zone five times. So uh, outside the box, they had seven take-ons, uh, well, seven shots. Uh, and the shot place in XG was 2.43, culminating in a total XG of 2.33. Schwinn, you amaze me. Are you just fucking following this shit? Uh, it's the guy who does uh, the XG numbers for Arsblog. Uh, to his credit, his model, I think, is pretty good i think it's one that gives a bit more in uh num- you know notice into the influence i think i think that's the es- essence of xg it's influence and regular stats are impact uh, i don't think xg gives you all the answers i think it's it's a f- further qualification and i think his model is pretty good hmm. there you go okay can you find me a recipe for dim sims uh, I can do that. Thank you want you. that right now? Yeah, please. Think- <laughs> can we not do that there? Oh, sorry. We're still on air. Okay, let's go. <laughs> uh, Tony's like, fuck these cunts. <laughs> um, I've got three questions, boys, from Maddie, who asked them on Skype. So we, we have pretty much covered them, Maddie, but I'll read them out, mate, and if you fellas think you can add anything to it. Um, if Nacho, Klazanach, Bellerin are not fit for Liverpool... How do you think we should set up three at the back, question mark? Not a bad shot. 
it, it might we may be forced into it to be honest if we don't have three of our four fullbacks we have no other option yeah it's right at the best. especially when we have three fit centre backs which has been a rarity hmm Okay, uh, was it wrong to put a Wobi on the right? Uh, he could have done a better job at the left protecting Granite. But then Uber doesn't get in the team. I think he put square pegs in round holes. Okay, um, and what is your thoughts on Licksteiner when he came on for Hector? I thought he did well. Mm, for me, probably his best 45 minutes for us. Okay, you agree with all that, Schwinn? Yep. Okay. Right, boys. Right. <laughs> right now, okay. Um, <laughs> do you want to do a quick midweek prediction, Tony? I'm not going to bother wasting my breath with you, uh, Schwinn. I'll go for a two 0 Understated, heavy rotation. Not expecting anything more. Not expecting anything less. What did you say? Two 0 Yep. I'm going to say we lose 1-0. Mm. First one yep. of this season. Yep. I think, yep. I'm going to say we lose it. I just think we're so fatigued at the moment. And I don't I mean, know. Tess don't even know who we're playing, so you can kind of take it <laughs> in yourself. We're playing Blackpool. <laughs> I know what division that. of Blackpool in? Oh, they're in League, 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 uh, Blackpool League 1. You lucky cunt. I do follow the AFL Cup. Um, <laughs> do you want me to tell you where Blackpool are coming on the ladder to? That's the quickest Google search of all time. I, I was going to say, we all have Google. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone has Google. They're coming 12th on the ladder. They've won 14 games. They've played 14 games, won five. Do you, do you want me to keep going? Well, if you would have like acted a bit more stupid and said, "Yeah, I watch him," and but you've made it so obvious you're googling it, but, no, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> um, no, I haven't watched one of their fucking games, to be honest. Um, yeah, but anyway, I'm going to say one nil, we lose. Um, Liverpool Arsenal. Do you want a prediction there, Schwin? Because we two one be, we to the be, Arsenal. We won't be on, will we? Um, I'm going to say we lose 3-1 oh, Negative nanny in the house i got a call as I saw it mate I've got people following my tips here so they, they really want to win some money So you know I call it as I see it should we? Is it time to remove that 5 out of 5 thing from the intro then? <laughs> <laughs> I just think we're really going to struggle against Liverpool, boys. I just, uh, I think, yeah, fucking this left left back, this left back, right back is just a fucking shit fight. Um, if Bellerin's still out against Liverpool, uh, if we're Monreal, real, yeah. I just think it's just it could be, uh, it could be a fucking really worry. Look, I hope I'm actually wrong, lads. I've Fuck me, I really hope I'm wrong, but I just... You look back at the opening two games, Manchester City and Chelsea, um, you know, and what was, I suppose, we we had a fit team, didn't we? Now we've got 12, 13 weeks in, and we've got a team of players who are, you know, niggling injuries and ins and outs and fatigue and rotation problems and I think we're coming up against the Liverpool team who gets the whole week off I'm I'm a bit worried I'm a bit worried um what what's your I know you're not going to give a prediction Tony but what's your thoughts on the whole game um the Liverpool favourites this yeah Liverpool favourites I'll, I'll take a point now which is probably the best assessment of where I think their game's at. Someone says, oh, the game finishes 1-1. Would you take it? I would. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Hey, hey boys. Um, anything else to add? No. Nope. We will be back after the Liverpool game. That is a certainly, and that will be on... I don't know what day of the fucking week. Six days, six days from today. Six days from today. 
Hey, hey, thank you for listening. Thank you for downloading. You can follow us at clockend underscore talk on Twitter. You can hit us up on Facebook. Give us a like there. Uh, you can listen to the podcast on all good podcast apps and YouTube. And thank you for listening. Thank you for following. Goodbye. See you, boys. Hoo-ah. Uh-huh.